a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Kroger Tender Ray Beef, no other beef so fresh can be so tender, presents... Hearts in Harmony transcribed. Mmm, mmm, Kroger Tender Ray Beef. It's delicious. Yes, you and your family are due for an exciting experience when you serve Kroger Tender Ray Beef. All around the table, you'll hear everybody saying, Delicious. And no wonder. Kroger Tender Ray is the one beef that's always fresh, always tender. You know it's tender because by the Kroger Tender Ray method, the top U.S. government grades of beef are made naturally tender without aging. You know it's always fresh because by the Kroger Tender Ray method, there's no need for wasteful aging, no time for loss of savory juice. No other beef so fresh can be so tender. Yet Kroger Tender Ray beef costs no more than ordinary beef. And don't forget, Kroger guarantees it's the best eating beef you've ever served or your money back. So today, plan to treat your family to the one beef that's always fresh, always tender. Treat them to Kroger Tender Ray Beef. It's the finest beef value in town. And now, hearts in harmony. When Penny Gibbs came home married to Johnny Keith, Dr. Joel Evans was there waiting to have a long-arranged date with her. Joel was as stunned as everyone else, but all he said was, Penny... Best wishes from the bottom of my heart. Johnny, congratulations, and I mean it. This was the last seen and heard of Joel. It's several days later now, and as Penny walks into the community center, she is greeted by Angela Brill, who says... Here comes the bride, Johnny. It'll be enough of that, Angela Brill. I'm an old married woman now. Three days and she's an old married woman. Uh Oh, Penny, how can you take it so calmly? You want to know a secret? Uh Uh-huh. Inside, I'm as excited as a child. I thought so. That's more like it. How is Mrs. Keith this morning, by the way? Oh, Mrs. Keith, huh? (laughs) You know, that sounds strange to be called Mrs. Keith. Well, it sounded strange to me when I said it. The whole idea of your being married seems strange. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) I didn't mean it that way. I mean, it's been such a surprise and a shock. Oh, a shock. It's hard to believe. I know it is. Everybody says that. I feel that way part of the time. I feel that it's not quite real. Then what's that ring doing on your finger? Are you wearing it for a friend? Mm Mm-hmm. A very good friend. A very close and a very dear friend. My husband. Oh, that was sweet. How is Johnny? He's wonderful. Oh, guess what? He and Jed are going into partnership. At least Jed's taking Johnny into his firm as a full partner. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what Johnny intended to do, stay in Rossville or move to some other town. No, he wouldn't move. He could find any work here, any work at all. Neither one of us ever want to leave Rossville. You know, I don't ever want to leave Rossville either. Pat feels the same way. (laughs) Well, why should he? He has everything he wants here. Here he found what he wants, and here he has what he wants. Uh, when's the wedding, Angela? Oh, I don't know. Well, you've talked about it, haven't you? (laughs) Well, personally, the idea of a wedding, even an informal one, frightens me. Oh, the prospect of one would frighten me, too. Oh, you're beyond that stage, Penny, remember? (laughs) You know, it's silly. It's really strange that I can't get used to the idea of being married. Good heavens, Penny, do you mean to say... Well, I mean, you wouldn't uh, accidentally agree to a date with someone, would you? With uh, Joel, for instance? (laughs) No, that's carrying a lapse in memory too far. No, I, I wouldn't... Penny, what's the matter? I guess I'm aware of my marriage a great deal more than I admit. I haven't given Joel a thought since Johnny and I came home married, and and Joel was waiting to take me to that dance. I heard about that. Must have been an awfully awkward situation. Well, Joel made it easy. He wished us both the best, made a joke about the date we were supposed to have and left. But, Angela, I... I know. No, no, I don't think you do. Angela, I feel as if I've cheated Joe, been awfully unfair to him. Well, you never promised him anything that I know of. Yes, I know that's true, but he did leave Everton Hospital because of me. Because he loved me and wanted to marry me. He gave up everything on my account. But you didn't tell him to give it up. No, I didn't. I begged him not to leave the hospital, but he left it anyway. Then you've no reason to feel that you've cheated him. (laughs) 
I have, though. I should have told him weeks ago that there was no chance that we'd ever marry. Could you honestly tell him that? No, no, I guess not. I really had no intention of marrying Johnny until... Until? Until I just had to marry him. Until I wanted to marry him more than anything in the world. But I should have warned Joel that it might happen. Well, you didn't know it would happen. You had no intention of marrying anyone for a long time to come. You told me that dozens of times, remember? Yes, I remember that, but I've still done Joel an injustice. A terrible injustice. I should have told him I'd never marry him at any time under any circumstances. You couldn't have done that, Penny. There was a time not long ago when you could have married him and might have if Johnny hadn't come home. I remember that time, even if you don't. I remember that time, too, Angela. Well, then, don't you see, if you told him you couldn't marry him under any circumstances at any time, you'd have been lying. Well, that's all past. What am I going to do about him now? Well, what do you have to do about him? I have to do something to make up for what I've done to him. But you haven't done anything I to have, him. I have, Angela. I've cost him his job. I've made him give up a brilliant future. And for what? A broken heart. Or maybe I'm wrong in thinking Joel really cared that much for me. Penny, Joe loved you more than words can tell. He still loves you the same way. I suppose he always will. He shouldn't love me now. He should hate me. He gave up everything for me, and I gave him nothing in return. Nothing. What he gave up for you, he gave up of his own accord, Penny. You didn't encourage him. In fact, you did the opposite. Yes, but I still want him to get it all back, Angela. Look, do you think that there's a chance that I... He'll get back in Heatherton Hospital? Mm-hmm. Not a chance. You're sure about that? Yes, very sure. Yes, but how can you be sure? Well, one of the nurses from the hospital came to see me just yesterday, and, well, we talked about Joel. She said that Dr. Weston gets angry every time he hears Joel's oh, name. Oh, that's silly. How can a man as brilliant as Dr. Weston be so stubborn? Angela, suppose Joel went to Dr. Weston. Oh, Joel would never do that, Penny, and you know it. No, you might as well give up the idea of ever seeing Joel back in Heatherton Hospital. Well, I suppose you're right, but I'll always feel that I cost him the opportunity he had there, Angela. I- I'll just never be able to make that up to him. Um, have you seen him since... Since your marriage? Yeah. Yes, I have. How is he? All right. But you might as well know the truth, Penny. Well, you've probably guessed it. He's taking it rather hard. I was afraid he would... Uh, Angela, I really ought to talk to him. I ought to try and explain. Why don't you? Because I don't think he'd let me. Oh, I'm sure he would. Well, even if he would, I wouldn't know where to begin or how to explain it. Perhaps there wouldn't be much to explain. Joel knows what it is to be in love. Why don't you phone him or get in touch with him no, somewhere? No, I'm afraid, Angela. But why? Because I've hurt him enough. I'm afraid I'll hurt him even more. Don't you see? A, a wrong word or a wrong meaning given to a word... Well, he might be hurt for a lifetime. You know Joel better than that. He's no child. He knows there are a lot of times when people have to be satisfied with second best. Yes, but I hardly gave him a chance. I, I told him no more than a week ago that I had no intention of marrying anybody. Anyway, for a long time to come. And look what's happened now, Angela. I'm married. Oh, best wishes, darling. You know I haven't <laughs> said that to you yet. Oh, thank you for the wishes. That was nice. If half of my good wishes come true, I'll be a very happy young woman. If only half of them. Still worried about Joel, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I'm going to do it, Angela. I'll try what you suggest. Hello, Penny. Hello, hello, Joel. Come in. Thanks. How's the beautiful bride? Oh, I'm not beautiful and still not used to being a bride. Um, h- how's the doctor? Oh, busy doctoring. <laughs> I'm glad you're busy. So am I. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't come right after you phoned. I had to see two patients before I could get away. Oh, well, that, that's all right. Um, it's silly to stand out here. Come on in, sir. All right. Now, why don't you sit down? In the chair that at one time seemed almost reserved for me? I don't know why not. Oh, for a lot of reasons. Or maybe just for one. Uh, I'll sit over here. Or is this Johnny's chair? Johnny has no special chair. That was unfair of me, Penny. I know why you called me over. Or at least I can make a pretty fair guess. 
It's to try to explain. I'm afraid it'll be a very poor try. Well, I won't make it any more difficult by appearing bitter, Penny, because I'm not. You know, you have every reason to be. I wasn't fair to you. Well, you did take me rather unaware. But that's the way things are sometimes. That's the way things happen, when you least expect them. That's why I quit Heatherton Hospital. I wanted to be near you and with you as much as I could. As much as you'd let me so that nothing could happen to... But it did happen, didn't it? Yeah. It um, came to me almost as suddenly as it came to you. Really, Joe, it wasn't planned. We decided suddenly it was all over very suddenly without a thought for anyone else. Or... How, how much it might hurt other people. Oh, I'm sure it hurt no one, Penny. Well, I know I hurt you, Joe. No, Penny. Not a bit. I'm disappointed. I can't deny that. This has been the biggest and most bitter disappointment of my life. Will you forgive me? Will you stop hating me? Hating you? Penny, if I could hate you now, it would mean that I never really loved you. I'll tell you frankly and with no shame at all. I love you now. Now, as much as I ever did. I'll admit that to anyone, to you, to Johnny, to anyone who is concerned or interested. How can I deny it after loving you as I have? You know, your love for me is hopeless, don't you? Hasn't it always been? We didn't know it until now, but it was always hopeless. Joel, you're the kindest, most thoughtful, most considerate man I've ever known. Penny, don't hand me superlatives that belong no, to you. No, no, I mean what I say. How can you be so kind? I, I don't know. I, I know that you left Heatherton because of me, in hopes that you could marry me. That was foolish of me, wasn't it? But I'm not sorry. I lost you, sure. But I can't say to myself that I lost you because I didn't try. Oh, Joel, I beg you not to leave the hospital. You remember that, don't you? Yes, only too well. I know I shouldn't have done it. That should have been a warning that... Well, that's over and done with. And so are we. What about you? I mean, what do you... I've created this situation for myself. I'll make the best of it. I'm still a doctor. I'll build a practice here, make something of it. <laughs> I'm not going to join the Foreign no. Legion if that worries you. No, that doesn't worry me a bit, and I'm glad to see you smiling. Oh, I have a lot to smile about. There's only one thing makes me frown. What's that? I don't know what I'll do next time I see that husband of yours. Shake his hand or poke him in the nose. So even in his disappointment and perhaps hidden bitterness... Joel can joke. Can this young man who loved Penny and lost remain a part of Penny's life without hurting himself and her? Is it wise for Joel to stay in Rossville? Be sure to listen to the next dramatic episode of Hearts in Harmony. Mmm, Kroger Tender Ray Beef. It's delicious. Yes, ma'am, Kroger Tender Ray is the best eating beef you ever tasted. Simply delicious. For Kroger Tender Ray is the one beef that's always fresh, always tender. No other beef so fresh can be so tender, yet it costs no more than ordinary beef. And ladies, Kroger also offers you more meat for your money. Yes, through a special way of cutting beef, Kroger gives you more meat, less waste. You see, before the meat is weighed and priced, Kroger removes excess bone, excess waste, and stringy ends. So to get the most, to get the best, Get Kroger Tender Ray beef. Ladies, remember this when you go to buy Kroger Tender Ray, the one beef that's always fresh, always tender, always delicious. Remember that it's available only at your Kroger store. And don't forget this. Kroger gives you more meat for your money. Because in Kroger cut beef, you get more meat, less waste. Visit your neighborhood Kroger store soon and get the finest beef value in town. Kroger Tender Ray Beef. Tune in again tomorrow, same time, same station, for another thrilling transcribed chapter of Hearts in Harmony. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the 
far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Ray Bradbury's tale, The Velt. This is the office of Dr. David McLean, resident psychiatrist of the new Chicago Institute of Human Engineering. All right, Miss Carver, will you take this, please? To Charles S. Haworth, Senior Psychiatrist, New Chicago Institute of Human Engineering. The following constitutes my report on the case of George and Lydia Abbott, which we discussed by telephone. Subject George relates onset of symptoms to the purchase of a $60,000 soundproofed happy life home. Under narcosynthesis during initial interviews, subject described the experience in the following manner. Miss Carver, would you play back the sonic record of the initial interview? We'd always wanted one, and then we could afford it, so... Go on, Mr. Abbott. Tell me about the home. The home? Well, it was supposed to do everything, the agent told us. And it did, I guess. It clothed us, fed us, and rocked us to sleep, played and sang, and it was good to us. Very good, sure. Tell me about the nursery. The nursery? The nursery, ah. It was completely automatic? Completely automatic. There were crystalline walls that wavered from two to three dimensions. There were pseudo-textured floors that shifted from brick to dirt to waving grass. The nursery was the best, but then we wanted the best for the children. Doctor, I must be crazy. We have no children. What about Peter and Wendy? They're your children. Oh, no, no. We have no children, Doctor. We have no children. All right, Miss Carver. To continue. After three sessions, the subject was able to recall and accept the idea that he had two children. He described the first day. All right, Peter and Wendy. This is your nursery. What's so special about a nursery, Dad? Plenty. Just go in and see. Do we have to? You'll be surprised. Gee. Go ahead. I'm scared. I'm not. Hey, it's nice in here. It is? Come on in, Wendy. Boy, look at the pictures on the walls. They're real. <laughs> They're almost real. You can change them any way you like, just by thinking. Go on in, dear. Well, all right, Mommy. Hey, Wendy, look what I can do with the pictures. That's the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. Sure. I just thought about it, and there it was. Let me try. Peter, let me try. Well, go ahead. Just think. How about Wizard and Oz? I want to see Wizard and Oz. <laughs> well, dear, there we are. Oh, they like it. Don't why, they? why shouldn't they? All I have to do is think, and they've got whatever they want in three dimensions. Color, sound, and smell. <laughs> oh, it's nice that we can give them all these advantages. Sure. What else are we working for, huh? Mm. Well, what do you want to do this evening? Well, the Petersons asked us over for bridge, but well, if you... Well, we don't have to worry about the kids. They'll be all right in the nursery. Come on, Lydia. We deserve a night out. And in the nursery, the walls were a kaleidoscope of time and space and imagination. The green forest of Sherwood and the quiet forms of Robin and his merry men gave way to the roll of the high seas and the smell of salt in the air as Sir Henry Morgan sailed into the harbor at Jamaica. 
And behind the crystalline quartz walls, the vacuum tubes and grids and banks of metal image tape spun quietly and efficiently, erasing the line between illusion and reality. Of course, the electric bill from Consolidated Utilities was tremendous, but it was worth it. The happy life home breathed contentedly as life proceeded with soft automaticity as guaranteed in the brochure and bill of sale. George. Hmm? Uh, George, I wish you'd look at the nursery. What's, uh, what's wrong with it? I don't know. I was in the nursery last week. It's perfectly all right. It's different now. What do you mean, different? I want you to come and see. Are the kids there? No. Madge Allen took them to a show along with her kids. That's why I want you to look at it now before they get back. Oh, all right. What you expect me to do, I don't know. I'm no mechanic. This isn't a question of a leaky faucet, George. All right, dear. I'm coming. The nursery light flicked on as they came down the hall. The relays clicked and the tubes warmed and chemical odor banks and pipes bubbled into life as they paused before the closed door. Go ahead, George. Open it. On all sides, in three dimensions, stretched the hot, tired landscapes of an African belt reproduced to the last stick and pebble and bit of straw. The ceiling above them became a sky with a hot yellow sun. A wind blew in from the baked veltland. The hot straw smell of lion grass. The cool green smell of the hidden waterhole. The great rusty smell of animals. The howl of the jackal in the distance. And the papery rustling of the great vultures that wheeled and circled under the yellow burning sun. Let's get out of this, son. It's a little too real. Oh, George, you promised you'd look around. Well, I don't see anything. Wait a minute. There are the vultures. Filthy creatures. There. There are the lions. Far over that way. Yes, I see them. Well, they're on their way to the water hole. They've just eaten. It's some animal. A zebra or a baby giraffe, maybe. Can you see it? Are you sure? It's a little late to be sure. Nothing over there but clean bone and the vultures swooping down for what's left. Did you hear that scream? What scream? About a moment ago. Sorry, no. Oh, here come the lions. George, they're frightening. Take it easy, William. They're just illusion. The lions were 15 feet away. So real, so startlingly real, you could feel the prickling fur on your hand, and your mouth was stuffed with the dusty upholstery smell of their heated pelts. And the yellow of them was in your eyes like the yellow of an exquisite tapestry. The yellows of lions and summer grass, and the sound of the matted lion lungs exhaling on the silent noontide, and the smell of meat from the panting, dripping mouth. George... I'm afraid they're so real. They're only an illusion, Lydia, that's all. Watch out! Ah! Out, quick, outside! They almost got us. Now take it easy, calm down. I could feel their breath. Get a hold of yourself, Lydia. They aren't real. Walls, that's all it is, crystalloid walls. They look so real. Of course they do. But it's all dimensional color reactionary process and metal tape film behind glass screens. It's all odor of phonics and sonics. Now, here. Take my head. I'm afraid. Did you see? Did you feel? It? It's too real. No, no, Lydia. We've got to tell Wendy and Peter not to read any more on Africa. Of course, of course, dear. I want you to lock that place up. But you know how difficult Peter is about that. I punished him last week by locking the nursery for an afternoon, and he threw a tantrum. And Wendy, too. Well, they live for the nursery. It's got to be locked. That's all there is to it. You've been working too hard, Lydia. You need a rest. I don't know. Maybe I don't have enough to do. I have too much time to think. All I do is set the menu selector dials at the beginning of the week. But that's the whole idea. The house is automatic. I know, but couldn't we turn it off for about a week and take a vacation? 
You mean you want to fry eggs for me? And darn socks. I feel like I don't belong here. The house is wife and mother and maid. How can I compete with the African belts? George, Hmm? those lions can't get out of there, can they? Of course not, dear. Now, don't think about it anymore. They ate alone. He sat idly watching the dining room table produce warm dishes of food from its mechanical interior. You forgot the ketchup. That's better. It wouldn't hurt to lock the children out of the nursery for a while. It was clear that they had been spending too much time in Africa. At sun, he could feel it on his neck still like a hot paw. And the lions and the smell of blood. Remarkable how the nursery caught the telepathic emanations of the children's minds and created a life to fulfill their desires. The children thought zebras, and there were zebras. Sun, sun. Giraffes, giraffes. Death and death. They were so young. But long before you knew what death was, you were wishing it on someone else. But this, the long, hot African belt, the awful death in the jaws of a lion, and repeated again and again and again. The children came home dutifully at 8.30. Hi, Mom. Hi, Pop. Hi, darling. Do you want something to eat, dear? We're just having dessert. We're full of strawberry ice cream. And hot dogs. We'll just sit and watch. Sure. Uh, Peter, uh, tell us about the nursery. The nursery? All about Africa and everything. I don't understand. Well, your mother and I were just traveling through Africa with Rod and Reel. There's no Africa in the nursery. Oh, come now, Peter. We know better. I don't remember any Africa. Do you win? Uh Uh-uh. Go run and see, huh? Sure. uh, I'll be right back. Wendy, come back here. Wendy! Oh, she'll be right back, Pop. She doesn't have to. I've seen it. Come on. Sure, Pop. But Wendy will tell us. Open the door. See, Daddy? It's not Africa. It's Florida. Like in Bandy. There go the deer. See? It isn't Africa. I see it isn't. Go to bed. But it is a nine o'clock. You heard me. Go to bed. Okay. Good night, Mom. Good night, Pop. Good night. Good night, dear. I'll be right in. Wait a minute, Lydia. Look at this. What is it? This is the corner where the lions were, isn't it? What is that you picked up? An old wallet of mine. There's a smell of hot grass on it. The smell of a lion... It's wet with saliva. And it's been chewed. George, those smears of blood. Come on out. Now let's go to bed. But in the middle of the night, he was still awake. And he knew his wife was awake. George, how did your wallet get in the nursery? I don't know. Wendy must have changed the walls from the African belt. I'm going to keep it locked. Maybe it isn't good for the children. My father used to say children are like carpets. They should be stepped on occasionally. We've never lifted a hand. They're spoiled and we're spoiled. I think I'll have Dr. McLean come tomorrow morning and have a look at Africa. But it isn't Africa now. It's Florida and Bambi. I have a feeling it'll be Africa again before then. Although their automatic somno beds tried very hard, the two adults could not be rocked to sleep for another hour. A smell of cats was in the night air. And in the morning, the stove cooked French toast, and the dining room table poured the syrup and melted butter. Pop? Yes? You aren't going to lock up the nursery for good, are you? That all depends. On what? On you and your sister. We feel you should have some variety, dear. I wouldn't want the nursery locked up ever. 
Well, as a matter of fact, we're thinking of turning the whole house off for about a month. Sort of camping out. Be fun for a change. Now, don't you think so, Wendy? No. It'd be awful. I don't want to do anything but look and listen and smell. What else is there to do? Oh, all right, all right. Go play in Africa. Are you going to shut off the house soon? We're considering it. I don't think you better consider it anymore, Pop. I won't have any threats from you, son. Okay, Pop. Come on, Wendy. Let's get back. <laughs> After breakfast, Dr. David McLean arrived. Oh, I saw the nursery last year, George. It looked all right to me. You didn't notice anything unusual? No. The pattern showed the usual violence, a tendency towards slight paranoia. All children feel persecuted by their parents. It's perfectly normal. There. There it is. Suppose we take a look at it now. They entered without knocking and sent the children out. The screams had faded and the lions were feeding quietly under the trees. I wish I could see what they're eating. How long has this been going on? A little over a month. It certainly doesn't feel good. I don't want feelings. I want facts, George. George, a psychologist, never saw a fact in his life. He knows about feelings. And this doesn't feel good. Now, my advice to you is to have the whole room torn down and your children brought to me every day for the next year for treatment. Is it that bad? I'm afraid so. You know, that's why the nursery was developed originally, to let us examine the patterns left on the wall by a child's mind. But what is it? What's wrong with Peter and Wendy? Well, it's hard to say. I haven't punished them more than average. Oh, I took away a few gadgets. Last week, I locked the nursery to show I meant business. You've let this room replace you and your wife in your children's affections. This room is their real father and mother. And now you come along and want to shut it. You can feel the hatred coming out of that sky. George, turn everything off. The nursery, the automatic kitchen, the whole automatic house. And start now. But won't the shock be too much for the children? I don't want them going any deeper. Let's get out of here. Never like these rooms. and get nervous. Those lions look real, don't they? I don't suppose there's any way... What? That they could become real. Not that I know. Some flaw in the machinery, tampering? No. I don't imagine the room will like being turned off. Nothing ever likes to die, even a room. I wonder if it hates me for turning it off. Paranoia is thick today. Well, hello. Is this your scarf? It's stained. Brown. Blood. That's Lydia's. Come on, the main fuse box is out here. Right, go ahead. Pull the switch. The two children were in hysterics. They screamed and kicked and threw things. They yelled and sobbed and swore and jumped on the furniture, weeping. It's off and it stays off. The whole house dies as of now. He marched around the house, cutting switches and pulling fuses. Insults won't catch you anywhere. I wish you were dead. We were for a long while. Now we're going to start really living. Instead of being handled and massaged, we're going to live. Once more, Daddy. Just once more. One more minute of the nursery, that's all. Just one more minute. Oh, George, it can't hurt, really. Oh, oh all right, all right. Only shut up. One minute, and that's the end. Forever. Gee, thanks, Pop. Thanks. And then we're going on a vacation. Dr. McLean is coming in half an hour to help us out. Lydia, turn on the nursery for just a minute. Oh, boy. Come on, Wendy. Come on. Thanks, Daddy. Thanks a lot. Just one minute, remember. Now, where'd I put those suitcases? Lydia. Don't shout, George. I'm right here. Did you leave them alone in the nursery? Well, I've got to get ready, George. Well, I guess we'd better get them out of there before they get involved with those beasts again. Hi! Come on, quick. Wendy, Peter, what's the matter? Hurry up. 
Open the nursery. Wendy! Peter! Well, they aren't anywhere. Wendy! Peter! Peter! The door. Open the door. Oh. They've locked up from the outside. Peter! Peter! Wendy! Peter! Open the door, dear! Let us out, Peter! Open the door! It's time to go! Open the door! George! The lions! Peter, do you hear me? Open this door! Call around us, George! Son! Son, do you hear me? Let us out! Son! George! Look out! When Dr. David McLean came half hour later, he found the two children in the nursery sitting in the center of the open glade eating a picnic lunch. Beyond them was the water hole and the yellow veldt land. Above was the hot sun. At a distance, Dr. McLean saw the lions fighting and clawing and then settling down to feed in silence under the shady trees. Hi, kids. Where are your mom and dad? Oh, they'll be here directly. Good, good. We've got to get along. He squinted at the lions with his hands up to his eyes. Now they were done feeding and they moved to the water hole to drink. A shadow flickered as the vultures dropped down from the blazing sky to finish what the lions left. Dr. McLean? Dr. McLean? Huh? What? Have a cup of tea? Which concludes my report to date. There were no lions, of course. Not in a physical sense. Lydia and George were devoured, however, almost as surely as if there had been lions. Their personalities were devoured by the mechanistic marbles which had usurped their role as parents. All four members of the family are under intensive therapy now and are doing as well as can be expected. Send that by telerope, Miss Carver. Oh, and uh, would you ask George Abbott to step inside? I'm ready for him now. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Belt, written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Mary Patton, Bill Quinn, David Pfeffer, Beverly Lunsford, Charles Penman, and John Larkin. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Dan Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Ray Bradbury's tale, The Velt. (laughs) 
This is the office of Dr. David McLean, resident psychiatrist of the new Chicago Institute of Human Engineering. All right, Miss Carver, will you take this, please? To Charles S. Haworth, senior psychiatrist, new Chicago Institute of Human Engineering. The following constitutes my report on the case of George and Lydia Abbott, which we discussed by telephone. Subject George relates onset of symptoms to the purchase of a $60,000 soundproofed happy life home. Under narcosynthesis during initial interviews, subject described the experience in the following manner. Miss Carver, would you play back the sonic record of the initial interview? We'd always wanted one, and then we could afford it, so... Go on, Mr. Abbott. Tell me about the home. The home? Well, it was supposed to do everything, the agent told us. And it did, I guess. It clothed us, fed us, and rocked us to sleep, played and sang, and it was good to us. Very good, sure. Tell me about the nursery. The nursery? The nursery? Ah. It was completely automatic? Completely automatic. There were crystalline walls that wavered from two to three dimensions. There were pseudo-textured floors that shifted from brick to dirt to waving grass. The nursery was the best, but then we wanted the best for the children. Doctor, I must be crazy. We have no children. What about Peter and Wendy? They're your children. Oh, no, no. We have no children, Doctor. We have no children. All right, Miss Carver. To continue. After three sessions, the subject was able to recall and accept the idea that he had two children. He described the first day. All right, Peter and Wendy, this is your nursery. What's so special about a nursery, Dad? Plenty. Just go in and see. Do we have to? You'll be surprised. Gee. Go ahead. I'm scared. I'm not. Hey, it's nice in here. It is? Come on in, Wendy. Boy, look at the pictures on the walls. They're real. <laughs> They're almost real. You can change them any way you like, just by thinking. Go on in, dear. Well, all right, Mommy. Hey, Wendy, look what I can do with the pictures. That's the white rabbit. From Alice in Wonderland. Sure. I just thought about it, and there it was. Let me try. Peter, let me try. Well, go ahead. Just think. How about Wizard and Oz? I want to see Wizard and Oz. <laughs> well, dear, there we are. Oh, they like it. Why, they? why shouldn't they? All I have to do is think, and they've got whatever they want in three dimensions. Color, sound, and smell. <laughs> Oh, it's nice that we can give them all these advantages. Sure. What else are we working for, huh? Mm. Well, what do you want to do this evening? Well, the Petersons asked us over for bridge, but well, if you... we don't have to worry about the kids. They'll be all right in the nursery. Come on, Lydia. We deserve a night out. And in the nursery, the walls were a kaleidoscope of time and space and imagination. The green forest of Sherwood and the quiet forms of Robin and his merry men gave way to the roll of the high seas and the smell of salt in the air as Sir Henry Morgan sailed into the harbor at Jamaica. And behind the crystalline quartz walls, the vacuum tubes and grids and banks of metal image tape spun quietly and efficiently, erasing the line between illusion and reality. Of course, the electric bill from Consolidated Utilities was tremendous, but it was worth it. The happy life home breathed contentedly as life proceeded with soft automaticity as guaranteed in the brochure and bill of sale. George. Hmm? Uh, George, I wish you'd look at the nursery. What's, uh, what's wrong with it? I don't know. I was in the nursery last week. It's perfectly all right. It's different now. 
What do you mean, different? I want you to come and see. Are the kids there? No. Madge Allen took them to a show along with her kids. That's why I want you to look at it now, before they get back. Oh, all right. What you expect me to do, I don't know. I'm no mechanic. This isn't a question of a leaky faucet, George. All right, dear. I'm coming. The nursery light flicked on as they came down the hall. The relays clicked and the tubes warmed and chemical odor banks and pipes bubbled into life as they paused before the closed door. Go ahead, George. Open it. On all sides, in three dimensions, stretched the hot, tired landscapes of an African belt reproduced to the last stick and pebble and bit of straw. The ceiling above them became a sky with a hot yellow sun. A wind blew in from the baked veltland. The hot straw smell of lion grass. The cool green smell of the hidden waterhole. The great rusty smell of animals. The howl of the jackal in the distance. And the papery rustling of the great vultures that wheeled and circled under the yellow burning sun. Let's get out of this, son. It's a little too real. Oh, George, you promised you'd look around. Well, I don't see anything. Wait a minute. There are the vultures. Filthy creatures. There. There are the lions. Far over that way. Yes, I see them. But they're on their way to the water hole. They've just eaten. It's some animal. A zebra or a baby giraffe, maybe. Can you see it? Are you sure? It's a little late to be sure. Nothing over there but clean bone and the vultures swooping down for what's left. Did you hear that scream? What scream? About a moment ago. Sorry, no. Oh, here come the lions. George, they're frightening. Take it easy, Lydia. They're just illusion. Lions were 15 feet away. So real, so startlingly real, you could feel the prickling fur on your hand, and your mouth was stuffed with the dusty upholstery smell of their heated pelts. And the yellow of them was in your eyes like the yellow of an exquisite tapestry. The yellows of lions and summer grass, and the sound of the matted lion lungs exhaling on the silent noontide, and the smell of meat from the panting, dripping mouth. George! I'm afraid they're so real. They're only an illusion, Lydia, that's all. Watch out! Ah! Out, quick, outside. They almost got us. Now take it easy, calm down. I could feel their breath. Get a hold of yourself, Lydia. They aren't real. Walls, that's all it is, crystalloid walls. They look so real. Of course they do. But it's all dimensional color reactionary process and metal tape film behind glass screens. It's all odor of phonics and sonics. Now, oh, here. Take my head. I'm afraid. Did you see? Did you feel it? It's too real. No, no, Lydia. And we've got to tell Wendy and Peter not to read any more on Africa. Of course, of course, dear. I want you to lock that place up. But you know how difficult Peter is about that. I punished him last week by locking the nursery for an afternoon and he threw a tantrum. And Wendy, too. Well, they live for the nursery. It's got to be locked. That's all there is to it. You've been working too hard, Lydia. You need a rest. I don't know. Maybe I don't have enough to do. I have too much time to think. All I do is set the menu selector dials at the beginning of the week. But that's the whole idea. The house is automatic. I know, but couldn't we turn it off for about a week and take a vacation? You mean you want to fry eggs for me? And darn socks. I feel like I don't belong here. The house is wife and mother and maid. How can I compete with the African belts? George, hmm? those lions can't get out of there, can they? Of course not, dear. Now, don't think about it anymore. <laughs> They ate alone. He sat idly watching the dining room table produce warm dishes of food from its mechanical interior. You forgot the ketchup. That's better. 
It wouldn't hurt to lock the children out of the nursery for a while. It was clear that they had been spending too much time in Africa. At sun, he could feel it on his neck still like a hot paw. And a lion's and the smell of blood. Remarkable how the nursery caught the telepathic emanations of the children's minds and created a life to fulfill their desires. The children thought zebras, and there were zebras. Sun? Sun. Giraffes? Giraffes. Death? And death. They were so young. But long before you knew what death was, you were wishing it on someone else. But this, the long, hot African belt, the awful death in the jaws of a lion, and repeated again and again and again. The children came home dutifully at 8.30. Hi, Mom. Hi, Pop. Hello, Hi, darling. Do you want something to eat, dear? We're just having dessert. We're full of strawberry ice cream. And hot dogs. We'll just sit and watch. Sure. Uh, Peter, uh, tell us about the nursery. The nursery? All about Africa and everything. I don't understand. Well, your mother and I were just traveling through Africa with Rod and Reel. There's no Africa in the nursery. Oh, come now, Peter. We know better. I don't remember any Africa. Do you win? Uh-uh. Go run and see, huh? Sure. Uh, I'll be right back. Wendy, come back here. Wendy! Oh, she'll be right back, Pop. She doesn't have to. I've seen it. Come on. Sure, Pop. But Wendy will tell us. Open the door. See, Daddy? It's not Africa. It's Florida. Like in Bambi. There go the deer. See? It isn't Africa. I see it isn't. Go to bed. But it is a nine o'clock. You heard me. Go to bed. Okay. Good night, Mom. Good night, Pop. Good night. Good night, dear. I'll be right in. Wait a minute, Lydia. Look at this. What is it? This is the corner where the lions were, isn't it? What is that you picked up? An old wallet of mine. There's a smell of hot grass on it. The smell of a lion... It's wet with saliva. And it's been chewed. George. Those smears of blood. Come on out. Now let's go to bed. But in the middle of the night, he was still awake. And he knew his wife was awake. George, how did your wallet get in the nursery? I don't know. Wendy must have changed the walls from the African belt. I'm going to keep it locked. Maybe it isn't good for the children. My father used to say children are like carpets. They should be stepped on occasionally. We've never lifted a hand. They're spoiled and we're spoiled. I think I'll have Dr. McLean come tomorrow morning and have a look at Africa. But it isn't Africa now. It's Florida and Bambi. I have a feeling it'll be Africa again before then. Although their automatic somno beds tried very hard, the two adults could not be rocked to sleep for another hour. A smell of cats was in the night air. And in the morning, the stove cooked French toast, and the dining room table poured the syrup and melted butter. Pop? Yes? You aren't going to lock up the nursery for good, are you? That all depends. On what? On you and your sister. We feel you should have some variety, dear. I wouldn't want the nursery locked up ever. Well, as a matter of fact, we're thinking of turning the whole house off for about a month. Sort of camping out. Be fun for a change. Now, don't you think so, Wendy? No. It'd be awful. I don't want to do anything but look and listen and smell. What else is there to do? Oh, all right, all right. Go play in Africa. Are you going to shut off the house soon? We're considering it. I don't think you better consider it anymore, Pop. I won't have any threats from you, son. Okay, Pop. Come on, Wendy. Let's get back. <laughs> Thank you. 
After breakfast, Dr. David McLean arrived. Oh, I saw the nursery last year, George. It looked all right to me. You didn't notice anything unusual? No. The pattern showed the usual violence, a tendency towards slight paranoia. All children feel persecuted by their parents. are perfectly normal. There. There it is. Suppose we take a look at it now. They entered without knocking and sent the children out. The screams had faded and the lions were feeding quietly under the trees. I wish I could see what they're eating. How long has this been going on? A little over a month. Certainly doesn't feel good. I don't want feelings. I want facts, George. George, a psychologist, never saw a fact in his life. He knows about feelings. And this doesn't feel good. Now, my advice to you is to have the whole room torn down and your children brought to me every day for the next year for treatment. Is it that bad? I'm afraid so. You know, that's why the nursery was developed originally, to let us examine the patterns left on the wall by a child's mind. But what is it? What's wrong with Peter and Wendy? It's hard to say. I haven't punished them more than average. Oh, I took away a few gadgets. Last week, I locked the nursery to show I meant business. You've let this room replace you and your wife in your children's affections. This room is their real father and mother. And now you come along and want to shut it. Well, you can feel the hatred coming out of that sky. George, turn everything off. The nursery, the automatic kitchen, the whole automatic house. And start now. But won't the shock be too much for the children? I don't want them going any deeper. Let's get out of here. I never like these rooms. I'm getting nervous. Those lions look real, don't they? I don't suppose there's any way... What? That they could become real. Not that I know. Some flaw in the machinery, tampering? No. I don't imagine the room will like being turned off. Nothing ever likes to die, even a room. I wonder if it hates me for turning it off. Paranoia is thick today. Hello. Is this your scarf? Stained. Brown. Blood. That's Lydia's. Come on, the main fuse box is out here. Right, go ahead. Pull the switch. Yeah. It's off. Two children were in hysterics. They screamed and kicked and threw things. They yelled and sobbed and swore and jumped on the furniture, weeping. It's off and it stays off. The whole house dies as of now. He marched around the house, cutting switches and pulling fuses. Don't let them do it. Don't let Pop kill everything. I hate you. I hate you. Insults won't get you anywhere. I wish you were dead. We were for a long while. Now we're going to start really living. Instead of being handled and massaged, we're going to live. Once more, Daddy. Just once more. One more minute of the nursery, that's all. Just one more minute. Oh, George, it can't hurt, really. Oh, oh all right, all right. Only shut up. One minute, and that's the end. Forever. Gee, thanks, Pop. Thanks. And then we're going on a vacation. Dr. McLean is coming in half an hour to help us out. Lydia, turn on the nursery for just a minute. Oh, boy. Come on, Wendy. Come on. Thanks, Daddy. Thanks a lot. Just one minute, remember. Now, where'd I put those suitcases? Lydia. Don't shout, George. I'm right here. Did you leave them alone in the nursery? Well, I've got to get ready, George. Well, I guess we'd better get them out of there before they get involved with those beasts again. Pop! Pop, come here! Daddy! Mommy! Come on, quick. Wendy! Peter! What's the matter? Hurry up! Open the nursery. Wendy! Peter! Well, they aren't anywhere. Wendy! Peter! Peter! The door. Open the door. Oh. They've locked up from the outside. Peter! Peter! Wendy! Peter! Open the door, dear! Let us out, Peter! Open the door! It's time to go! Open the door! George! The lions! Peter, do you hear me? Open this door! They're all around us, George. Son! Son, do you hear me? Let us out! Son! George! Let go! When 
When Dr. David McLean came half hour later, he found the two children in the nursery sitting in the center of the open glade eating a picnic lunch. Beyond them was the water hole and the yellow veldt land. Above was the hot sun. At a distance, Dr. McLean saw the lions fighting and clawing and then settling down to feed in silence under the shady trees. Hi, kids. Where are your mom and dad? Oh, they'll be here directly. Good, good. We've got to get along. He squinted at the lions with his hands up to his eyes. Now they were done feeding and they moved to the water hole to drink. A shadow flickered as the vultures dropped down from the blazing sky to finish what the lions left. Dr. McLean? Dr. McLean? Huh? What? Have a cup of tea? Which concludes my report to date. There were no lions, of course. Not in a physical sense. Lydia and George were devoured, however, almost as surely as if there had been lions. Their personalities were devoured by the mechanistic marbles which had usurped their role as parents. All four members of the family are under intensive therapy now and are doing as well as can be expected. Send that by telerope, Miss Carver. Oh, and, uh... Would you ask George Abbott to step inside? I'm ready for him now. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Belt, written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Mary Patton, Bill Quinn, David Pfeffer... Beverly Lunsford, Charles Penman, and John Larkin. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Dan Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. The underwater city of Euclidia is a weird and terrifying place, and it would seem almost impossible to escape from this well-guarded scientific colony 400 feet below the level of the South Pacific Ocean. It would be impossible for anyone depending on the mechanical devices protecting Euclidia, but the adventuring Gregory party escaped from the magic island with the help of their brave little homing pigeons, and now it appears that these same little birds may aid them again. The girl submarine commander, who has proven a friend in many instances, has informed Jerry and Joan that the homing pigeons are kept in the very laboratory where Captain Bradford will work with G-47. The great difficulty now will be how to plan the use of the pigeons without being overheard. Jerry and Joan are discussing this in their own quarter. Are you sure it's all right for us to talk now, Joan? We are quite safe. This small room is completely lined with Euclidean cloth. Then you're sure that if we put this cloth around the room carefully every time we want to talk in here that nobody's going to hear us? That is the situation. However, we must ascertain that the cloth is in perfect condition each time we use it. Huh? Oh, what could happen to the cloth? You understand, do you not, that the soundproof qualities of this Euclidean cloth are contained not in the fabric of the cloth itself, but in the liquid with which the cloth is saturated. Oh, sure, I know that. It's just plain old cloth made of seaweed until they soak it in that secret formula there. Precisely. And that soundproofing liquid may be removed just as it is applied with another liquid. Gee whiz, Joan. You mean that one of those Euclideans might sneak in here while we're out and spoil his cloth? Take the soundproofing out of it so we'd get caught next time we try to talk about something secret? That is precisely my meaning, Jerry. And I think it is only logical to expect such a move to be made. Yeah, well, I guess you're right. But now that we've got it all fixed up, let's figure out what we're going to do. I feel there is very little we can do until the captain is given the opportunity of working in the submarine laboratory with G-47 and locating the pigeon. Oh, then he'll have to plan a way to smuggle one of them on board a submarine or a rocket ship with him on a test run so that he can get a chance to turn the pigeon loose within range of Los Angeles. How far will one of those little birds be able to fly and find my mother's home in Los Angeles? Oh, that's the trouble, Joan. And that's the reason the captain's got to try to turn them loose pretty close to home. 
He's not sure how far they can make it now. At one time, the captain told me he thought a thousand miles would be their limit. Oh, that was all right then. They were just away from home a few weeks, and they were in training all the time. But now they've been locked up in a strange place for a long time, and they haven't had any practice. And Tex is afraid that a few hundred miles is all they can possibly make. Then it will be necessary for the captain to arrange a long test run with a submarine or a rocket plane to release the pigeons within a short distance of Los Angeles. Yeah, that's it. And he will be closely guarded on those tests. Well, yes. But Tex figures yes and no on that. What do you mean, yes and no? Well, G-47 knows that Tex is plenty smart about machinery and probably just as good a scientist as any of the rest of them. And when Tex is out with one of those ships, testing it to find out what's wrong with it, G-47 is going to give him plenty of chance to do his stuff. Nevertheless, to carry a homing pigeon aboard with him and find the opportunity of releasing it without being observed will prove very difficult. Oh, but it's not that hard. Tex won't care if he's observed or not once the pigeon gets away. That is a mistake, Jerry. What's the mistake about it? I think we may consider that the release of the pigeon will be detected, probably at the time it is released, or surely within a very short time. Well, what of it? If the pigeon gets away, he's away, and that's that. No, Jerry. As you would say, that is not that. Well, why isn't it? In the first place, if the pigeon is released from a rocket ship, which I consider most likely, the ship could easily overtake and destroy the little bird. Did you ever try catching a little bird going 40 miles an hour? Naturally not. Did you? No, but I don't have to. You're the one that thinks it can be done. I see no reason why that should be particularly difficult. But in the event that fog or clouds allow the pigeon to safely lose itself, it would merely become necessary for one of the scientists to send a radio message to a Euclidean agent in Los Angeles. And the pigeon would be caught as Mr. Johnson waited for its arrival. Yeah. Gee, I never thought of that. Johnson wouldn't even be waiting for its arrival. Johnson's like everybody else by now. He thinks we're all killed when that artificial volcano eruption made it look like the island was destroyed. Precisely. He will be expecting no communication from us, and the little bird may not find anyone ready to receive its message. Well, just the same. Tex figures that he can get a chance to use those pigeons to do us some good, and I think so, too. I hope you are correct. Well, I know I am. And in the meantime, let you and I plan a few things of our own. What do you wish me to do? Oh, help me think. Think about what? Think about escaping from the city in the cellar. That would only be a waste of time. Except for the captain's daring plan, we have no hope. Sometime I get so blamed sore at you that I could give you a good spanking. What is a spanking? Didn't you ever have one? No, Jerry. I have never had a spanking. Is it something I would like very much? No, it's something you wouldn't like very much. A spanking means that I'd turn you over my knee and paddle you good. Paddle? I have heard of paddle. That is the instrument with which a small boat is propelled through the water, is it not? Well, I wasn't thinking of just that kind of paddle, but maybe it's a good idea at that. Hello, children. Oh, Mother. Mrs. Gregory. Well, what's the matter? You two seem surprised to see me. Here, we well, are. I'll say we are. How did you get in here? How did I get in here? You mean in this room? No, I mean in this apartment. This big place where all our rooms are. Well, I simply walked in. Jerry, do you realize what that means? Boy, I'll say I do. That means that anybody else could have walked in just as easy and heard all we were saying. Were you discussing something you did not want overheard? Yes, Mother. We have covered this small closet with the Euclidean cloth, as you can see, and we were discussing... Look out, John. If Mrs. Gregory walked in on us, anybody else could do the same thing. It was indeed stupid of us, Jerry. We should have realized that while this cloth was making this room soundproof, it was also making it impossible for us to hear anyone entering these chambers. I hope you haven't given away any of Tex's ideas. No, I guess we have, if anybody was listening. Oh, Jerry. I think we are safe this time, Mother. Jerry and I have been speaking but a few moments. And you would probably have seen anyone leaving who might have overheard us. Yes, probably. But now that you have this little room fixed up so well, we'll continue using it with this added protection. When any two of us are discussing our plans, a third one must remain out in that other room on guard. You're right, Mrs. Gregory. And I hope it isn't too late for your idea to be of any good. I would not worry about that, Jerry. The element of time involved in our recent discussion should prove adequate protection. Yeah, we didn't talk long either. That is precisely what I said. Well, then you took too long to say it. Well, here you are. Oh, Tex. Sure happens quick. What's this? Now you can understand how startled Jerry and I were. I do understand. 
Now, I also understand how dangerous it is to speak in the false security of this room. Well, what's going on here? Well, John and I covered the inside of this room with that Euclidean soundproof cloth, as you can see. And when we were talking in here, Mrs. Gregory popped in just like you did. You see, Tex, Johnny and Joan feel that someone else, someone from whom our plans should be concealed, could have walked in on them just as easily as I did. Oh, I see. That could happen. But remember that nobody would overhear very much when you had these curtains drawn as they were when I came in. I never heard a sound until I stuck my head through these drapes you put up. Oh, boy. That's your relief. Nevertheless, I feel that one of us should remain in the outer chamber whenever we are discussing anything of value. By all means. Yes, it might be safer. I have a little something to plan with Jerry right now. Yes, Captain. No, not for the moment, Joe. I'll tell you and Pat later. Now, if you two ladies will get busy doing nothing out in the central room, Jerry and I can do a little planning and safety behind these curtains. Come, Joan. It's nearly time for lunch. We'll freshen up a bit. Very well, Mother. Do not be long, Jerry. Okay, Joan. We'll be there when the... Well, Jerry's voice was certainly cut off sharply when that curtain fell over the doorway. That cloth is perfectly soundproof. And, Mother... Yes, dear? I think that should render our fears groundless. Oh, what do you mean, even if someone had entered and walked unheard to that door, as you and the captain did, they could not have heard what we were saying without opening the curtains as you did. Mm, let's hope you're right. But remember, Joan, dear, there are a great many things about this weird underwater city that we know nothing about. Perhaps there's some way G-47 and the other scientists could overhear your conversation in that room. Of course, that is possible. But I do not think it is at all likely. Well, we can't help any by worrying about it. Come, dear, let's get ready for lunch. But I have not heard the luncheon signal yet. You'll hear it any minute now. And then that table will start coming up through the floor. You know, I'd like to visit the kitchens here and see how they do it. I believe that could be easily arranged. We will ask G-47's permission. They must have a wonderful organization there. Food prepared for and served to nearly 300 people in a half an hour. That is sufficient time, is it not? <laughs> well, apparently it's quite enough here. But back home, it wouldn't be long enough. I am afraid, Mother, that all things back home, as you call your world, must be forgotten. Now, now, Joan, that's no way to talk. Tex and Jerry are planning right now. And when those two get down to business, things usually happen. Jerry is very clever for one so young, is he not, Mother? Yes, he is. But most young people at that age are clever. Perhaps as clever as Jerry. Most of them never get a chance to show what they really can do. As older people insist on dictating to them, overruling them on everything, and molding them to older standards, whether they fit or not. Now, Tex isn't like that. He's always figured that anybody old enough to think and express their thoughts is old enough to have an opinion worth listening to. And when Jerry gets an idea, Tex listens. The captain is a very fine and understanding man. You are quite fond of him, are you not, Mother? Why, uh, <laughs> it's... Yes, Joan, I... Well, naturally, dear, I, uh... Oh, don't you? Come on, let's get ready for lunch. Mother, why do you always seem so nervous? And why do you wish to change the subject when I inquire into your feelings for the captain? Now, Joan, dear, we're too busy for that, and, and I... Oh. oh, there's the luncheon table. Yes, and the steel slide is moving in the floor. Our luncheon table will be up in a few seconds. Perhaps you'd better go over there and tell Tex and Jerry that lunch is served. Surely they would know that. The signal is quite plain. But uh, would they hear it behind the clock? Oh, how stupid of me, Mother. Of course not. I will call them at once. Captain Tex, Jerry, will you come? Mother. Yes, Joan? Come here, quickly. What is it, dear? Has something happened? Well, that I do not know, but the captain and Jerry are not here. Not here, let me see. They are gone. But how, where? Is there any other opening to that not door? Not that I have been able to locate. Only this small door and the walls, floor, and ceiling are of solid steel. But, Joan, two men just don't fade away through solid steel. Of course they do not. Nevertheless, they are gone, and they did not come through the door. But where did they go, and how? Joan, we must know what happened to them. Down in the underwater city of Euclidia, 400 feet below the surface of the South Pacific Ocean, Mrs. Gregory and her daughter Joan find themselves in a strange and terrifying situation. One of the smaller rooms in the quarters assigned to them by the Euclidians has been lined with a soundproof Euclidean cloth to allow them to talk in privacy. Jerry and Captain Bradford were in this small room discussing plans for the possible use of homing pigeons in their escape when the time comes to capture the city. When luncheon is served... Joan calls to the conspirators. 
but they don't answer. Mrs. Gregory rushes to Joan's side. The room is empty. But, Joan, there's no way to get out of this little room. I think you are mistaken, Mother. But these walls are solid steel behind this cloth. Granted, nevertheless, Jerry and the captain are not in here now. Well, where did they go? That we cannot determine. Oh, Joan, at times I think you were the most exasperating child I've ever known. I am sorry, Mother. Oh, forgive me, Joan. I didn't mean that, really. But all of this disappearing and jumping around noiselessly from place to place is just a little too much for me. I suppose you do find it disturbing, but I have lived so long with the Euclidians that such actions are perfectly natural to me. Well, they're not natural to me. Jerry and Tex have disappeared, and we're going to do something about it. What can you suggest? Well, we'll have to look for them, Joan. I am quite willing to search, but it will be a foolish effort. We know that the construction of this room is solid steel. Nevertheless, Tex and Jerry got out of this room. And the means of exit is certainly closed to us. Oh, I suppose it's hopeless. Like everything else that happens around here, we might as well sit quietly and wait for the Euclidians to bring the answer to us. I think it would be far more sensible to partake of our lunch while we are waiting. You're right, dear. We must eat. Hey, Tex, here's the door. Jerry! That door wasn't here a minute ago. And the captain! Oh, sure it's us. But where have you been? We haven't been any place but right in this little room. Captain, Mother and I had just looked in this room, and you were not here. Well, you can see that we're here now, and we never did go any place. Tex. Just what is this? Joan and I fell all over the walls of this room. We couldn't find a possible opening, and yet you disappeared, and the room was empty. Now, wait a minute, Pat. Don't get excited. There's something mighty funny going on here. Jerry and I were talking in this small closet, surrounded by this Euclidean cloth. When we tried to come out, the door was gone, but we never left the room. The explanation is quite simple, I believe. Well, then let's have it. Mrs. Gregory looks like she's just seen a ghost. Well, I am a little upset, Jerry. What's your idea, Joan? It could be only one thing. An optical illusion created by an additional partition dropped through the room. That could have been e easily enough done, but that means that we haven't the privacy we counted on. I'll say it does. We're only kidding ourselves about being able to talk in that little room. And if the Euclidians have overheard you, all of your plans about using the home... Careful, Pat. Yes, Mother. It is not wise to speak too freely now. I think we may safely feel that this soundproof cloth has served its purpose. I hope you're right. So do I. But I don't feel any too happy about it. I think we'd better eat while we have a chance. Remember that it'll be six o'clock tonight before they push the next meal up through the floor at us. Hey, look, we're too late. The table's starting to go back down through the floor. We are indeed too late. And I was hungry, too. Well, maybe I can catch something off the table before it gets down below the floor. Be careful, Jerry. That machinery must be very powerful. Too late, Jerry. It's no use. Well, you're right. Well, there went our lunch. Oh, I feel it's all my fault. If I hadn't been so frightened, Joan would have had sense enough to eat while the food was here. Do not feel badly, Mother. It will not hurt any of us to do without this one meal. Hmm, that's what you think. I'll bet I shrink all up before dinner. Yeah, I guess you can stand it, son. Well, now that we're all together again, what have we accomplished? Let's sit down and talk it over. Well, someone has been in this apartment. Someone has been here and has made several changes since our last meal. Well, we've been out of it since breakfast. I guess they've had plenty of chance to do anything they liked in here. But I don't see where anything's changed. Neither do I. I believe I know what you mean, Mother. Our steps no longer make any sound, and these metal chairs move noiselessly along the floor. Yes, Joan, that's it. Golly, they've been in here and put that soundproof paint all over everything. Looks like it, but why should they do that? You will find your radio reception much clearer in a soundproof room. Thales. Yes, but where is his voice coming from? From the radio receiver installed in your apartment. So, we're going to have a radio now. Where is it? In the wall near the exit to the main corridor. Yeah, look. I see it now. I see a square of steel that appears to be slightly newer than the rest of the wall. That is the radio installation. You will find the switch in the wall panel. After I am through addressing you, you may use this equipment at your pleasure. However, at this time, you will be prepared to give your attention to a broadcast originating in the United States. Gee, news from home. Oh, it'll certainly sound good to hear someone who speaks as we do. Wait a minute, Pat. These Euclidians are so anxious to have us hear this broadcast. I have an idea that we're not going to like it any too well. You are correct, Captain Bertford. It is entirely possible that this broadcast will contain material which may prove distasteful to you. Nevertheless, it will also contain information which should make your present position quite clear to you. How soon does all this happen? I am speaking to you from the central communication chamber in the heart of Euclidia. Before me is a chronometer, perfectly synchronized, 
with the time employed on your radio station. In a few seconds, I will connect your receiver with our main apparatus, and you may listen directly to a news broadcast originating in Los Angeles. The guest of honor is your former assistant, Mr. Johnson. Johnson? Mother, you're Mr. Johnson. But what is he doing on a radio news program? Silence. In less than 20 seconds, you will hear the answer for yourselves. Hey, what is this? I don't know any more about it than you do, Pat. But I think we'd better sit still and listen. That is an excellent suggestion, Jackson. Good idea, too. Quiet, everybody. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our regular meeting with an outstanding figure in the news of the week. The past week has been a lively one in the world of news, with events crowding each other out of the way for a place on page one. But we've chosen as the most interesting single news item of the week the story of the Gregory expedition to the South Seas, and the mysterious disappearance of the so-called Magic Island. Gee, it's We're about We're fortunate in having with us in the studio today a man who has been closely associated with Mrs. Patricia Gregory for several years, one of her most able lieutenants, and the man who directed the rescue of the Gregory party on two previous attempts to escape from the influence of the Magic Island, Mr. Clyde Johnson. Will you come in, please, Mr. Johnson, and allow us to ask you a few questions? Yes, for the sake of the general interest in this cruise... I'll be glad to offer such news as I have. Well, Mr. Johnson, your attitude suggests that your news isn't going to be very pleasant. Indeed, it isn't. On the contrary, I know what I have to say will strike deeply into the hearts of the thousands who have followed so sympathetically Mrs. Gregory's search for her long-lost little girl. If you'll allow me, Mr. Johnson, I'd like to guide the path of this interview, not through any desire to interfere with your freedom in telling your story, but rather to help you extract a brief yet complete picture from the whole story. Well, I wish you would do just that. I feel that there's so much to be told. Well, I just don't know where to start it. Suppose we start with the beginning of the first cruise to this island. Well, Mrs. Gregory and Captain Tex Bradford, who was in charge of all her travels and cruises, had heard over shortwave radio that her long-lost little girl, Joan, might be found on a strange island. The position of the island was given accurately. That position was 29 degrees south, 124 degrees, 30 minutes west, was it not? It was. A young amateur radio operator named Jerry Hall talked himself into the trip, and they sailed on Mrs. Gregory's yacht with a crew of two, an old sea captain, John Craig, and a Scotch engineer, Angus McLeod. They had no trouble finding the island, though it was certainly a weird place. The island was artificial, wasn't it? That's right. And in the complete description I shall give the news agencies, you'll find the dimensions. But for our purposes today, why, I'd say that it's enough to... <coughs> Pardon me. The island proved to be an unnatural place. Home of a colony of brilliant, though perhaps slightly mad scientists, who have developed many things far beyond our world. And the Gregory party successfully escaped from this island after finding Mrs. Gregory's little girl living there. Yes. They were caught and returned on their first attempt. But the second time, they helped themselves to one of the submarines belonging to the scientists, and they reached Los Angeles in safety. Uh, what isn't clear to your reporter, and I'm sure it isn't clear to our listening audience, is this. Why did they not stay safely in Los Angeles? Well, there were two reasons for that. First, because Captain Bradford was convinced that these scientists are a menace to the world and should be overcome. And second, because the scientists had so many spies and agents in California, all over the world for that matter, it seemed much safer for Mrs. Gregory, Joan, Jerry Hall, and the captain to remain together on a boat rather than to attempt to lead a normal life in this country. And on this last trip, they reached the island. We have every reason to believe that they did. In fact, we found their abandoned boat, stripped of everything of value, drifting at the exact location of the island. Might I ask how you were so sure of the location, if the boat was drifting? The position was correct, was that of the island. And it was exactly at that spot the eruption occurred. Eruption? Volcanic? Yes. The magic island was undoubtedly destroyed by an eruption. It must have been located in the crater of an extinct volcano. Well, that is one that was believed to be extinct. You saw this eruption? I'll never forget it. I was on the ship the United States had contributed to help wipe out this island. All around us were the ships of other nations who had joined us. Fully armed and ready to act as a body of international police to wipe out this menace to world safety. Well, there must have been at least a hundred witnesses on each boat. And everyone agrees perfectly on what happened. The sensation aboard ship was much the same as that of an earthquake. And the water was thrown violently upward in a shower of fire. The sound of dull explosions was plainly heard as vast caves filled with natural gas must have exploded. Well, there's, there's nothing left. 
nothing to mark the spot where the Gregory party landed to fit their knowledge against the scientists of that mad colony. You're sure, then, perfectly sure in your own mind, that this island was completely destroyed? Anything else would be impossible. And the Gregory party is, has gone with that island. And I think that's all. I know how hard it's been for you to tell us this story, Mr. Johnson. You may be sure that everyone listening is deeply sympathetic toward this little party of adventurers. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have listened to an account of the destruction of the tiny island in the South Pacific, the magic island as we've come to know it. And with this item, your reporter concludes this broadcast. I will now terminate your reception for this time. I trust you have heard and appreciated the story of your destruction. You are lost to the world, and you will remain so. Gee, that gives me the creeps. Oh, it wasn't pleasant, Jerry. To hear ourselves spoken of as being dead. Well, I don't blame Johnson or anyone else for thinking as they do, but we're very much alive. I'll say we are. And before we get through with these Euclidians, the whole blame world is going to know we're alive. fiction, science fiction. We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. Exploring tomorrow. And now here is your guide to these adventures of the mind... The editor of Astounding Science Fiction Magazine, John Campbell, Jr. Dreams are a remarkable thing, a remarkable power of the human mind. Freud, the psychoanalytical school, is held very important. But there's one aspect of dreaming that they deny, they overlook, perhaps. That's tonight's story.
and maybe help you too. You turned us down. You did all you could to block it. 
black market rabble? Well, he's never seemed to get you all. Probably bought off. That's right, bought off. Now, look, Bedford, for old time's sake, you want to get in on this along with us. I'll let you in. I have a sentimental feeling towards you. I think you sincerely felt you shouldn't okay our application. I never will. Even if you kill me. Oh, you mean that? I got my job. Responsibility. Heavy industry comes first. Remember when there were eggs, how the shells looked when they were dropped? Remember how it felt to crush the egg shell underfoot? How did that old nursery rhyme go about putting the pieces of the shell back together? But the way Bedford... We're making sure the next regional director isn't so devoted to heavy industry. We're getting in somebody with, uh, shall we say, an agricultural frame of mind. Okay, let's finish this up and get going. Get him over the rail. It's almost a mile to the ground. How could a thing like this happen to me and be forgotten? Can a person forget being knocked down, kicked, and threatened with death? It wasn't forgotten. It remained buried beneath, repressed. We'll have to try some more recall, Mr. Bedford. So far, I don't have enough to go on. Now, this business of Giller and his men beating and terrorizing you provides what's called the traumatic incident, the moment of fear that starts the chain reaction of repression going. But, uh, are you willing to try another recall? Not now, Doctor. You shouldn't stop at this point. I, I couldn't stand anymore. Tomorrow, maybe. We'd better go on now, Mr. Bedford. Now, from what you recall, I got an impression that there's no time to waste. I don't think they just beat you up and threatened you. I think they did throw you over the rail to your death. I think they killed you. All right, Doctor. I'll let you start your recall inducing gadget again, but don't don't make me go back to that moment. Something else. I couldn't stand to see them standing there above me. Higher and higher, and then the ramp and the railing disappearing. Now, this time I'd like you to think of something pleasant, satisfying. Perhaps a day in your work when you were particularly pleased with what you accomplished. around, lots of hot water. Wonder how many of us would be dead by now, dead from contamination from the perpetual fallout if we hadn't built those huge pools and fountains over there. It's the hardest decision I ever made. I felt like a lunatic giving them the go-ahead. A lot of people were angry about that. But after I saw the figures from the anti-radiation committee, it had to be done. No matter how many people got angry, I know my duty. It's to the whole people, not a few special groups here and there. Uh, you say you okayed the building of mass public baths, and you actually stood and watched the people bathing. That's right. Togas, like ancient times. Mr. Bedford, I want you to listen to me carefully. I have something important to say to you. What's, what, what's wrong, Doctor? Well, as a licensed general practitioner, I've been interested in the idea of public baths as an anti-radiation measure. In my opinion, it's a sound idea. But the proposal hasn't yet been put through. No baths have been built. Hmm? It'll be at least five years before the baths can be put into operation. <laughs> Interpretation doesn't quite check. Sometimes the dream isn't quite usual. If a man has a dream of the future, it's awfully hard to identify its source because the source hasn't happened yet. Tell me, Bedford, uh, you were exposed to a great deal of radiation in the early part of your life, and so were your parents. That's right. We all were. We all went through the blasts and the heavy fallout of the war, the contamination of our food, water, homes, clothing. Do you remember any unusual exposure, either to you or to your parents, radiation approaching a dangerous maximum? I, uh, let, let me try to remember. I, I'm confused. You think I'm some sort of a freak. Stop sitting there in the chair insulting yourself. You have to make plans. Plans? Huh. There's nothing I can do. 
There's no way I can stop him. Try to remember any toxic dose of radiation, especially in the earliest part of your life. Now go back to the enemy missile attack. Sirens. Can you hear sirens? You're possibly running toward a shelter. Your family running, too. Across a field, maybe. I'm sorry, Doctor. I've had all I can take. I'll see you again some other time. You're leaving? Thanks for the help. I've got to consider all this. Maybe I'm not remembering the future. Maybe it's just a false memory, a neurotic fantasy. How could we check? If it's really in the future... <laughs> What's the matter? I... I can't get up. What? I can't stand up. I'm afraid I'll fall. Doctor, now I can't even get to my feet. Well, make yourself comfortable in your chair, and we'll go on with the therapy, as I said we should. I guess I have no choice. Now, you know what we're after this time. At some point in your life, you apparently were exposed to a near toxic dose of radiation. Someday, some 
perfectly harmless person who never did anything wrong in his life. <laughs> future to control, and wherefore it has no fear. If you can feel fear, it means that you can sense the future. To the extent that you can sense the future, you can control it. You don't have to be stuck with any particular future. If you take the trouble to dream about the future, then you have a chance to do something about the future. If you don't like atomic wars, you have a chance to do something about it, provided you dream that it's there. Nightmare or not, you have a chance to do something. visitor from another world who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But before we join Superman, here is an important message. Yes, fellas and girls, here is an important message for you. A message direct from our fighting marines in the Solomon Islands, echoed by our blue jackets on the high seas, by the boys who wear our army and navy wings, our tank troops in Africa, our commandos in England. In fact, by every man in the American armed forces, no matter where he may be. And here's the message. We're going to win this war, they say. We're going to wipe Hitlerism and fascism off the face of the earth. We've taken on the job and we're going to see it through, but we can't do it alone. We can't do it without the help of every boy and girl and every man and woman back home. Now, we know the one way we can help those boys fight this war to a victorious finish is to see that they get all the guns and tanks and ships and planes they need. But those things require a lot of money, and that's where you and I come in. We help our government to buy those war materials by lending them our money, by buying all the war stamps we possibly can as often as we can. Why, right at this moment... There may be a detachment of American commandos carrying through a raid on occupied France, and they're equipped with guns and tanks and protected by planes and ships that you help to buy. That is, if you've been buying war saving stamps regularly. So let's make a promise to ourselves right now. Let's promise to buy war saving stamps as often as we can. Tell mother and dad about it. See if you can't get them to give you a dime a day for a war stamp, or even a dime every other day. Because remember that every dime is important. Because ten cents will buy five forty-five caliber bullets. Five dimes will buy enough fuel oil to take an American destroyer one full mile closer to its objective. And a dime a day from all the fellows and girls in the United States will buy enough fast pursuit planes to blast Hitler's Luftwaffe out of the sky. So do your share to help win this war. Every time that you've got a dime, buy a war-saving stamp. And now, the adventures of Superman. Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and Jimmy Olsen are now in Arabia, involved in some strange and mysterious adventures. In our last episode, we heard how a certain Countess Wojeska had been abducted by a band of Arab desperados headed by a man known only as the Red Fez. We also heard how Sir Mycroft Bittersweet, a penniless Shakespearean actor, had disguised himself as a fortune teller so that he might learn something of the Countess' whereabouts. 
As Kent, Jimmy, and Sir Mycroft returned to the hotel where the actor had left Lois, our friends saw Count Wajeska, the Countess' husband, moving stealthily along the street. Kent decided to shadow him and accordingly left the others. When Jimmy and Sir Mycroft arrived at the hotel, they found that Lois had gone, leaving a message which said that she was on her way to an old Arab mosque, an abandoned temple. Now, as our story continues today, we find ourselves in a room outside the old mosque, seated at a table as the man in the red fez. He is talking with one of his henchmen. Listen. Soon, Abu, this business will be finished. With the money we shall receive, we shall then be able to retire from a mode of life which I assure you, to one of my delicate temperament, is highly distasteful. You were always one for making high and mighty speeches, Master. You talk too much. It has been in my mind, Abu, for many a moon to curb your tongue. You do not accord me the respect that is due my position as leader of our little band. You will get from me all the respect you deserve, which is none at all. Oh, you wound me deeply, Abu. Can it be that you dislike me? Who can dislike what does not exist? I understand you now. I will explain. When first I joined your band, you were a good, clean, honest desperado. If someone wanted someone else put out of the way, we did the job quickly and efficiently in the best business-like manner, is it? The job was done, the money paid, and there was led to it. Mm, cut and dry business. No imagination. That may be, but uh, who wants imagination? I want money. Mm, oh, such a thing to say. Had I known you felt this way, I should never have permitted you to join my band. Not have permitted me. Ah, you you begged me to join. You literally came to me on your hands and knees. Join my band, Abu, you said. Please join my band. No one can cut throats like you can. But that's true. Well, I'm sick of you and your red fez and your theatrical productions. We're given the job of putting the Countess Vajeska out of the way. Do we do a workmanlike job of it? No, no, no. We have to hire a fortune teller and some long-haired flute player. For what, I ask you? For what? To lend an air of mystery to the proceedings. To give the man who hired us a little something for the large sum of money he will pay. All you were asked to do was to put the countess out of the way. She is still, so far as I can see, in very good health. We shall take care of that in good time. There is no better time than the present. But come, I will go into the next room and take care of her at once. You will do nothing of the sort. I believe it's a perfect finale for this little business, and I... Someone is knocking at the door. Obviously. Open it. Open it yourself. Careful, Abu. Remember who is master here. Open that door. Open it yourself. Abu, I prefer not to use force. Come another step toward me, and I will give you this knife. Really, Abu, I sometimes think... I have a beard of Allah. How long does it take you to open a door? Now, now, C.D. Now, now, yourself. I bring with me a beautiful captive in the best traditions of our business, and I'm forced to rap until my knuckles are raw. A beautiful captive? You, you say you bring a beautiful captive? Yes, the truth. I caught her snooping around outside. Bring her in, man. Take your hands off me. You hear what I said, you tin horn imitation of Well, a... Miss Lane, we meet again. Allah, be merciful. It's the girl we mistook for the Countess. This means more trouble. Trouble for Miss Lane, I'm afraid. All right, Zidi, take your men and go. Uh, before we go, when do we get paid? As soon as we get rid of the Countess. Uh, all right, I go. Come, man. Well, Miss Lane, I suppose you tell us what you were doing in this vicinity. Does it really matter? No, I don't suppose it does. Abu, would you be good enough to bind her hands behind her back? Since you put it that way, not at all. There's no need to tie me up. There's every need, Miss Lane. We shall not only bind you, but gag you as well. I would rather you and the Count of Jessica did no talking while you are together. You mean I'm to be placed in the same room with the Countess? Of necessity. It is the only room left beside this one, since the mosque was practically torn down stone by stone by that amazing individual in the red cape. And the Countess is still alive. Yes, worse luck. We could have put her out of the way long ago. Now, hold still while I make these knots secure. Abu, will you... Can I tie knots and answer doors as well? I am the master here. It is I again. What is it this time, Zidi? I have two more captives. Only this time they are not beautiful. Two more? So. One looks like a fortune teller, but talks like an Englishman until I gagged him. The other is a boy. 
He did not talk so much, but I gagged him anyway. Jimmy, it must be Jimmy and Sir Mycroft. Bring them in. With pleasure. Bring them in, man. We bring Jimmy. Jimmy! Sir Mycroft, why did you follow me here? I should never have left that message. They cannot answer you, I'm afraid, since they are well gagged, and we had best leave them that way. That is right. There's too much talk around here as it is. With this, I agree. Too much talk and too little action. Already all of Mecca is beginning to descend upon us here. I say, let's stop talking and do our job. Let us put the Countess and the rest of these people out of the way. No, let us, let us not be rash. We must wait until our employer arrives. I've arranged the finale, the like of which... A work, son, you and your finales. Was it in our agreement with our employer that we were to stage an entertainment for him as well? No. Now, get rid of the countess is what he said, and get rid of the countess is what we should do. No more, no less. Wait a minute. You mean that you were hired to do this job? You didn't kidnap the countess to hold her for ransom? Of course not, my child. You see... Enough of this, master. Yes, Abu. Henceforth, you are no longer the master. What? I hereby call upon the members of this band to join me in rising up against you. If anything is to be done, it must be done now. Let us get rid of the Countess and these others at once. We must wait and We wait for nothing. Sidi, you others, are you with me? Excellent. Stand back, Master. We now take matters into our own hands. You will regret this. You will regret it more than us if you do not hold your tongue. Tiddy, bring the cultus in here. At once. You mean that you, you're going to kill us? All of us? I uh, regret, but uh, that is exactly what I mean. But you can't do that. You can't. You hear? You can't. Benelli, gag her. Stop it. I'm an American citizen. Oh. Oh. Here's the countess, Abu. Good, good, good. Now then, place them all against the wall. The countess, Miss Lane, the boy, the old man. We shall make short work of them. Hark, listen. The temple bells strike the hour of midnight. <laughs> Even the time is right. As the Arab desperados prepare to put an end to Lois, Jimmy, the Countess, and Sir Mycroft, Clark Kent is shadowing Count Wajeska through the narrow, windy streets of Mecca. Suddenly, Kent stops short, steps into a doorway, and in a moment emerges in the blue and red costume of Superman. Now we'll take care of that, Count. Who are you? Let go of me. Not until we have a little talk, Count Jessica. How do you know my name? Who are you? Never mind that. What are you doing sneaking along this street? What business is it of yours? I'm going to make it my business. To begin with, where is your wife? Stand back or I'll blow you to pieces. With that little toy pistol, don't make me laugh. Stand back, I said. Stand back. Now, I'll relieve you of that ugly weapon. <laughs> what? Give me back that gun. Uh, no, you might hurt yourself. Guns are dangerous things. Now, suppose you tell me what you're up to. Let me go. You're killing me. Not quite yet, but I will, unless you start explaining a few things in a hurry. Uh, stop. I will tell you anything you want to know. Talk fast. Who kidnapped your wife? Where is she? Who's holding her for ransom? Nobody is holding her for ransom. She was kidnapped because I wanted her put out of the way. Why? I have been dependent on her... For as long as I can remember for any money I ever had. To make more money, I tried gambling. Lost heavily. I have many debts which must be paid or I shall go to jail. Disgraced forever. I knew my wife would never give me the money if I asked for it. There was only one other way. Her money, all of it, comes to me when she dies. And so I hired this band. Why, you can Please. Please don't hit me again. Where's the Countess now? Quick, where is she? There is an old and abandoned mosque on the edge of the town. Yes, I know it. Is that where she is? Yes, yes. That is the headquarters of the Arab band. Thanks for the information. And now, just so you won't see more than is good for you... <coughs> now then. I've got to get to that mosque, and fast. Up! Up! And away! <laughs> Red cloak flying in the wind, Superman wings through the night on his way to the abandoned mosque, little realizing how precious is every second. Is he already too late? Be sure to hear tomorrow's thrill-packed episode. Tune in tomorrow and every day, Monday through Friday, 
same time, same station, and follow the adventures of Superman. Fellows and girls, don't ever get the idea there's nothing you can do to help win this war. Of course, we can't all be members of Uncle Sam's armed forces. Because, well, because some of us are too old or too young. But that doesn't mean we can't get into this fight. No, sir. Because there is one big important thing we can do. We've got to see that our fighters are supplied with all the bullets and guns and the tanks and ships and planes they need to wipe Hitlerism and fascism off the face of the earth. How? By buying all the war-saving stamps and bonds we possibly can. Because every time we buy a war-saving stamp or bond, we lend our government money with which to finance the fight. So remember, talk with Mother and Dad tonight about giving you an extra dime every day or every other day for war-saving stamps. Talk about it with all your friends. Get them to make a place with you to buy war-saving stamps regularly. Faster than a speeding bullet! More powerful than a locomotive! Follow the adventures of Superman every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. This is Mutual. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's Superman! Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another world who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. But before we join Superman, here is an important message. Fellas and girls, have you ever seen a squadron of American bombers roaring through the air in formation? Have you seen newsreel pictures of Uncle Sam's destroyers cutting through the seas on patrol in search of enemy subs and surface raiders? I'm sure you have, and I bet you were thrilled. You probably felt terribly proud, too. Well, if you've been buying war-saving stamps regularly, you have a right to be proud. Not only because those planes and those ships represent the fighting spirit of America, but because you helped to build them. Yes, sir. Every time you bought a war-saving stamp, your money helped by the labor and materials that are used to make planes and ships and equipment to knock out the Nazis and the Japs. So next time you hear some boy or girl on your block say, Oh, shucks, what difference does it make if I buy one stamp or not? What difference can one dime make? You tell them that it does make a difference. It makes a big difference. Tell them, for instance, that five dimes will buy enough fuel oil to take an American destroyer one full mile closer to its objective, or that one dime will buy five forty-five caliber bullets. Tell them that if every boy and girl in the United States bought just one ten-cent war-saving stamp every day, it would add up to enough money to buy a lot of swift pursuit planes with which our Army and Navy forces could blast the axis out of the air. And while you're at it, you might remind them that this is one way that all you fellows and girls can help win this war. Now, after all, everybody can join Uncle Sam's armed forces. But all of us can buy war-saving stamps. So talk it over with Mother and Dad tonight. Tell them that you want to help Uncle Sam win this war by buying war-saving stamps regularly, every day if possible. And I'm sure that they'll be glad to cooperate. And now, the adventures of Superman. For some strange reason, a web of oriental mystery seems to be closing around Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and Jimmy Olsen, visitors to the city of Mecca in distant Arabia. To begin with, a knife was hurled at Kent as he and Jimmy were walking through a narrow street. Then Jimmy disappeared, and to cap the climax, a poisoned black narcissus was delivered to Kent's hotel room. In the meantime, Jimmy had called on the phone, saying he was unable to tell Kent and Lois where he was, but warning them that they all must leave Mecca immediately. In the face of all this, Kent decided to seek the help of the ruling potentate of Mecca, Sheikh Hussein Mohammed, who had, the day before, requested Kent to journey into the Belgian Congo in search of his son, missing for 15 years. 
In the midst of Kent's and Lord's conversation with the sheik, the aged Arabian ruler suffered a heart attack. Dying, he told Kent that his brother, Ben Ali Mohammed, was the leader of the deadly cult of the Black Narcissus, that it was he or his murderers who had made the attempts on Kent's life and probably abducted Jimmy Olsen in order to keep Kent from finding the sheik's missing son. As our story continues today, Lois has returned to the hotel, while Kent, in his true role of Superman, has gone in search of the sheik's brother. He has just leaped to the rear balcony of a house near the Temple of Allah. Listen. There's a light in the room off this balcony. Four men are seated around a table. Great Scott, one of them is that messenger, Keda, the Arab who first summoned me to the sheik's palace. So, he's in on this, too, eh? Well, there's only one thing to do. Break in, round them up, and locate Jimmy. The chances are they've got him in this house. Well, here goes. Don't move, any of you. I, I have seen such a one in the marketplace. He has the strength of ten men. You are quite right, Kada. You know my name? Yes, and I know a good deal more, too. Which one of you is Ben Ali Mohammed? It is I who bear that name. You are the brother of the sheik? I, uh... What have you done with the young American boy, Jimmy Olsen? I said I know not. You're lying. No. Where is the American boy? Answer me before I lose my temper. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, on. Those yeah, knives yeah. won't do you any good. Yeah. You might just as well yeah. put them away. Someone's going to get hurt, and it won't be yours truly. You had better surrender, Fendi. Yeah. Surrender? To four Arab cutthroats yeah. with knives? Not on your life. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. 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 That takes care of two of you. Uh, now then, Ben Ali. I... Where is he? Where is Jimmy Olsen? Uh, Fendi, I must plead ignorance, all powerful one. Please be merciful. Don't be merciful. make me laugh. Neither of you knows I... what the word mercy means. I... You particularly, Ben Ali. I... I've heard all about you and the black narcissus cult. I know you've been waiting around for your brother the sheik to die so you can inherit his title and his riches. Uh, now you see not all. He is not human. You've got something there, but enough of this talk. Now, lead me to where the American boy is hidden we at once. We do not know. By the prophet, we do not know. I've heard enough of your lies. This is the truth. Keda speaks the truth. Of this crime, we are not guilty. You mean you haven't seen the boy? I have. Uh... You didn't carry him away from in front of that house where the knife was thrown? No, no. This we did not do with him. Strangely enough, I'm inclined to believe you. Uh... But I'm going to search this house just to make sure. I don't either of you move from this room if you value your lives. We will do as you say, Fendi. Where does that door lead? To the stairway going to the ground floor. All right. Remember, don't move. No, no, no. Now is our chance, Penelope. Huh? We can escape him. Yeah, Matt Cater. Where can we go? What matter where we go? To escape him is enough. Come, we will climb over the balcony. Oh, I do not think it is wise. If he is all-powerful, he will find us. And I shudder to think of what will happen. Look on the floor. A boo and Takan do not move a muscle. No... It is best that we do not attempt to flee. He is not human, that one. And what do you expect will happen if we remain? He will have us behind bars. Did I not throw the knife at that reporter? Uh, Did you not send him a poison narcissus? A poison narcissus? Ah, why? He returns. It's a good thing you two didn't try to get away. Uh, oh, such a thought was never in our minds. If in... Uh, right now, you two, listen to me. Uh, I'll give you a chance to save your hides. Jimmy Olsen is somewhere. He vanished late this afternoon. Now, I want you to find him and return him to Clark Kent at the Oriental Hotel. Oh, there are many boys in Mecca, Rapendi. How would we know this one? He's about five feet tall, has blonde hair, freckles, and bluish-gray eyes. His name is Olsen. Jimmy Olsen. And um, what if we find him, Effendi? You will do us no harm. I'm making no promises. But it'll pay you to find him. Otherwise, you may both find yourselves behind bars for a long time. We will do our best, Defendi, this we promise. Aye, aye, aye. All right, don't waste any time. I'm going now, but I'll be watching you. And remember, I never sleep. Up, up, and away! Frankly, Clark, I don't quite understand why you let them out of your sight. Certainly, if they belong to the cult of the Black Narcissus, they're unscrupulous murderers. Well, right now, they're scared to death. Oh, you mean you frightened them? Well, yes, of course. Well, well, that is, I mean... Don't bother explaining. I'm sure they got down on their knees and begged for mercy the moment that you stepped into the room. Well, as a matter of fact... That... Mm-hmm. Oh, what's the use? You never think I can do anything, but one of these days, I'm going to become... Become what? Oh, never mind. All right, let's forget it. 
In the meantime, it's dark and Jimmy isn't back. I'm going to call the police. Now, don't do that, Lords. It'll just complicate matters. I'm sorry. I've waited too long as it is. Wait a minute, Lois. Wait a minute. Someone's at the door. How do you know? Never mind how I know. Shh. Look. A note being pushed under the door. Don't move. I'll get whoever it is. Clark, he's running down the hall. I'll get him. Ow. You'd be surprised. Ow. You hit me like a ton of bricks. Yes, I'll hit you with more than a ton of bricks before I'm through. Oh. All right, come on, young man. Into the room. Go in, Clark. Good heavens, it's Jimmy. Yes, Jimmy. Close the door. Jimmy, what happened to you? Oh, my head. Yes, my head. You stop moaning or I'll give you something to moan about. Don't talk to him like that. Heaven alone knows what he's been through. Surprised at you, Lois. Don't you realize he's responsible for all this? That nobody kidnapped him. He he made those mysterious telephone calls and tried to slip that note under the door just to make us believe he was in great danger. Why? Yes, why? That's what I want to know. All right. Start talking, young man. I didn't mean to do anything wrong. Don't bother about excuses. Why did you do it? To get to go to Africa with you. What's that? Mr. Kent said he didn't think he was going to take me to Africa. Well, I wanted to go. So I figured the best way was to make it look like we all had to get out of Mecca in a hurry. Ah. Now, did you ever hear of anything like that in all your life? Jimmy, you don't mean it. I guess it was silly. But I wanted to go to Africa. You wanted to go to Africa, and so you worried Lois and myself for three hours because of that. Aren't you ashamed? I guess I am. A little. Oh, only a little, eh? Well, maybe a lot. I'm really surprised at you, Jimmy. I thought you had more sense than that. Were you the one who left the black narcissus at the door? Black narcissus? I don't know what you mean. Oh, I'm afraid that was legitimate, Lois. Just so happened that... Jimmy's stupid hoax dovetailed with the other thing. Mr. Kent, did you find the fellow who threw the knife at you? Yes, I did. Well, that is uh, not exactly... Then we are in danger. I was right. We'd better get out of Mecca in a hurry. Yes, and go to Africa, I suppose. Sure. Now, right now, you're going to bed. Now, you sleep here in my room tonight. Lois and I are going out to send a cable to Mr. White. Have you had anything to eat? Oh, I bought some dates and some funny kind of cakes with seeds. Now, I guess you won't die of hunger. Now, get right to bed. You're so tired, you can't keep your eyes open. Come on, Lois. Oh, what about Africa, Mr. Kent? We'll talk about Africa tomorrow. Good night. Good night, Jimmy. Good night. Leaving the hotel, Kent and Lois walk toward the center of the city, where the cable office is located, unaware that their departure has been observed by the two members of the Black Narcissus cult, Ben Alley and Kader. Informed by Superman that Kent is leaving, living at the Oriental Hotel, the two Arabians decide to eliminate him in order to prevent his going into the Belgian Congo to find the sheik's missing son. Swiftly crossing the street, they enter the hotel lobby and converse in hushed tones with the Arabian clerk at the desk. Then, like shadows, they depart. Hours later, when the city of Mecca is shrouded in silence, Ben Ali and Kader again enter the hotel, mount the carpeted steps to the second floor, and pause in the corridor. You are sure, Ben Eli, there will be no mistake? No mistake, I promise you. Did not ask him who is on duty at the desk tell us the room number of this reporter, Kent? Did we not see him return to the hotel long since? I, uh, that we did. Then it is all simple. The room number is 19, there across the corridor. I have here a pass key. I will open the door quietly. You will enter, and in a moment there will be an end to it. You are ready? I, uh... Then come. You are sure the key will fit? We will I... see. Yes. The door is now unlocked. I will open it. There in that bed is the reporter. I see. Go, Kada. And be swift. Slipping into the room, Kader approaches the bed. Unaware that the figure huddled under the covers is not Clark Kent, but Jimmy Olsen, who is occupying Kent's room. Will he discover his mistake in time, or is Jimmy, blissfully asleep, doomed to suffer the fate planned for Kent? Don't miss tomorrow's thrill-packed episode, same time, same station. Tune in and follow The Adventures of Superman. By all means, don't forget to tune in to Superman tomorrow for another thrilling and exciting episode. And don't forget to talk to Mother and Dad before you go to bed tonight about making arrangements to buy war-saving stamps regularly. Start the day off right tomorrow. Buy at least one ten-cent war-saving stamp first thing after breakfast. 
And remember what I told you at the beginning of this program. Every single dime is important because all our dimes put together can go a long way to help pay for the guns and tanks and the planes and ships we need to knock out the Nazis and the Japs. And say, here's an idea. Why don't you get together with your friends tomorrow and make a joint pledge to buy war-saving stamps every time you've got a dime? See which of you can buy the most war-saving stamps every week and every month. Do your share to win this war. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leave tall buildings at a single bound. Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Follow the adventures of Superman every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station. Superman is directed by George Lothar and is a copyrighted feature appearing in Action Comics magazine. This is Mutual. Invite you to rock it into the future with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Stand by to raise ship. Blast off minus five, four, three, two, one, zero. Rockets blast off to distant planets and far-flung stars. We take you to the age of the conquest of space with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. At Space Academy, the bright sun glints along the polished metal of a rocket cruiser's hull. This is the Polaris, ready to blast off from the spaceport into the outer reaches of the universe. But on this fine day aboard their proud and eager ship, the Space Cadet crew, for once, shows no desire to leave. On the power deck, good-natured Astro scowls as he makes a final check of his equipment. Glaring through the viewport, Roger Manning complains bitterly to Tom Corbett. I tell you, Junior, this is the limit. They can't do this to us. That's what the man said as he picked himself up from the floor. But since the professor will be along any minute, Roger, you might as well stop blowing your... Uh, Ah, space dust. What are we, taxi drivers for any old fossil who wants to poke around on Titan? Stow it. We don't any of us like this mission. But you can't expect hot assignments all the time. Why not, Tom? We're the best unit in the academy. Says you. Says Commander Arkwright, even. You seem to be a little feverish, Roger. Or is your memory slipping? You mean when he fuses our jets? That's just an act. He knows we're good. Well, maybe he thinks this will be a nice rest. Rest. A straight run to Titan and then waiting hand and foot on some old goat of a scientist. Hello, boys. Oh, morning, sir. Uh, well, when I? Why, I'm your passenger. The old goat of a scientist. Uh... Yes, sir. <laughs> Glad to have you aboard, sir. Thank you, Cadet Corbett. And I'm sure that goes for Roger Manning, too. Uh, uh, well, I, I guess you aren't, sir. Uh, an old goat, I mean. <laughs> Thank you, Cadet Manning. You seem to know us, sir. I know quite a lot about the whole Polaris unit. You see, I'm not a scientist, either. Wait a minute. Our passenger's supposed to Whatever be... Whatever you were expecting, I am your passenger. Maybe you'd better explain, sir. I will. But first, are we ready to blast off? Blast off time set for 0800. It's three minutes to, and we're ready. No last-minute trips outside? No uh, girls you have to kiss goodbye, Manning? <laughs> he really does know about you, Roger. Yeah, well, I want to know more about him. Right. Here are my credentials, Corbett. Oh, thanks. Great. Jupiter. Take a look at these, Roger. Colonel Raymond Cowan, Solar Guard Intelligence Service. But, but, sir, you're not in uniform. In my line of work, we usually prefer not to be recognized. That's the reason for all this hocus-pocus about a professor on a field trip to Titan. Oh, then this is really going to be an intelligence mission. In a way. Well, that's better. What goes on on Titan, sir? Nothing that I know of. But then why... You see, you weren't told the correct destination either. We'll head in that general direction. 
But we're concerned with another moon of Saturn, Rhea. Rhea, hey. You've heard of it, I imagine. Well, everybody has, Colonel. The papers and magazines have been full of stories about it recently. Sure, ever since they developed that, what do you call it? You know, the stuff that knocks out virus disease. The virucide, F3, yes. Out of strange little crystal plants that are entirely unlike anything we've known, they've created the greatest miracle in medical history. If they can only make enough of it. Sounds as if you're pretty interested in it, sir. I am. But everyone should be. Think of it. Diseases that men have been trying to conquer for thousands of years. Some of the worst cripplers and killers can now be licked. No wonder they're starting to call Rhea the satellite of life. That's what it is. But our job is to keep it from becoming a satellite of death. What? what? So you see, this isn't going to be such a dull assignment, cadets. All right. Prepare to blast off. We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment, so stand by. Spaceman, if you want to blast through tomorrow at full space speed, then listen. Tomorrow morning, when Reveille sounds... Pop up and jump out of bed. <laughs> well, maybe jump is the wrong word. Anyhow, get out of bed and dress yourself. Next, wash yourself slowly and carefully. Well, at least wash yourself and brush your teeth. Okay, you'll pass inspection. Now, you're ready to enjoy the Spaceman's Breakfast, Kellogg's Pep. Wait, Spaceman, Kellogg's Pep deserves a bigger fanfare than that. Remember, Pep is the build-up wheat cereal with a wonderful flavor. Well, that's more like it. Lots of energy there. And that's just what you get when you eat Kellogg's Pep. Lots of food energy. Eat Pep, and you get the food power necessary to travel at full space speed. Pep supplies you with important vitamins that help build strong bones, tough muscles, and healthy teeth. But, Spaceman, that's not all. When you eat Pep, you enjoy its wonderful, rich malt flavor. Yes, that's what you'll say when you dig into a heaping bowl full of delicious Kellogg's Pep. So, Spaceman, start off tomorrow the Spaceman's Way with Kellogg's Pep. That's P-E-P. Pep. Kellogg's Pep. Space cadets ordered to fly a scientist to Titan, largest moon of the planet Saturn, are disgusted with such a dull assignment. But their passenger turns out to be Colonel Cowan of Solar Guard Intelligence. And their real destination, Rhea, another Saturnian moon which has become known as the Satellite of Light. Now, far out in space, Tom and Roger, having set the Polaris on course for Rhea, turn again to the Colonel. So what's the story on Rhea, sir? Well... For some time, we've been after a well-organized, completely ruthless space gang. They've been looting ships, raiding settlements, getting away with murder, literally. Can a gang like that be tracked down? We've made a start, but most of our leads have taken us just exactly nowhere. Well, what's the idea of the flight we're on? One tip we've received is that Rhea is the gang's next objective. Since I have a special interest, I was assigned to check. Why should a gang like that be interested in Rhea? Viricide F3, Corbett. The power of life or death over many thousands of people. I can see it would be quite a black market item, Colonel. Oh, they could make a fortune, all right. But it's more than that, boys. There's a leading member of the Solar Council who's doomed without that medicine. One of our planetary governors has a daughter who's very sick indeed. F3 will save her life. I don't get it. I think I do, sir. You mean they could use this medicine to exert pressure on important people? Exactly. The men who control F3 can get almost anything they want from almost anybody. Well, who's going to help a gang like that? Not helping could mean death for themselves or for someone they love. Well, even so, sir. The... Manning. Yes, sir? My wife is one of those who needs that medicine. I'm sorry. And if it came to saving her life, I don't know how far I'd go, even with a gang of killers. Of course, Colonel. I see you're beginning to understand. I can see that it'd all be true if they could monopolize Viricide F3. Well, the last shipment left Rhea six weeks ago. A shipment of less than 30 pounds. And while in space, the ship blew up. The gang did it? Most likely, though we don't know. But consider this. A raid on Rhea now 
would give them all the F3 that's been manufactured in the last three months. Yes, and suppose they blasted the processing plants and the scientists in charge. It'd take us a year to get into production again. And in the meantime, the gang would have the only supply of F3 in the entire universe. That certainly puts it right up to us, sir. If the tip about Rhea is true. Don't worry, Colonel. We'll blast those crooks right out of space. I know you will. That's why I asked for the Polaris unit. Better not tell Astro that. His head will swell up till it won't fit into his space helmet. Say, I forgot about Astro. There's no reason for him to stay on the power deck now. Well, give him a call in the intercom. Sure. Control the power deck. Come in, Astro. Astro, check in, will you? What's the matter with that Venusian ape? Could anything be wrong? Nah, he's probably on his way up there. See, here he is now. Hey, Bubblehead. Great galaxy. That's not Astro. You're right, it isn't. So don't anybody move. He's got a parallel ray gun. So have I. Have it? <laughs> Colonel Collins. Skip it. He's frozen. Sucker. Trying to draw on a guy that had him covered. You kids better be smarter. You dirty space crawler. You want some of the same? Take it easy, Roger. We haven't got a chance right now. Not now or ever. So just move back while I get his gun. That's it. What did you do to Astro? The big boy on the power deck? <laughs> He's in the deep freeze, too. <laughs> Never even saw me sneak up behind him. Pretty brave guy, aren't you? Being brave don't pay off, sonny boy. Look at your kino. Makes a real nice statue, don't he? All right, so you got us. Now what? Everything will come out okay if you two act like good little boys and keep this ship going right on course. As we're heading now? Yeah. I'm going your way. I got a date with my gang near Rhea. Rhea? Then the colonel's tip was accurate. Sure, just like he figured, we're taking over F3. And the price will be going way up. Tom, why should we run the Polaris for this space ride? Well, uh, how do you mean, Roger? Suppose we just quit, knock off, and let Ugly here run the ship himself. No, passive resistance, eh? It won't work, fellas, so don't even try. Oh, no, why won't it? I'll tell you. So far, I've been trying to be nice about this whole thing. Even using a parallel ray to just paralyze you monkeys instead of killing you with a heat blast. Well, thanks, sir. He... You're welcome, but get this straight. Try any tricks. I'll shove your buddy Astro and the colonel out into space. That'd be murder. Some might call it that. I'd call it a lesson for fresh kids. And if that didn't line you, I could get rid of you two the same way. Guess he's got a stymied, Roger. What? Where'd he be without a pilot, navigator, or radar man? Don't worry. I'd make out. I'm no hot rock space cadet, but with the course set, I could take the ship in from here. He could at that. Now, that's being sensible, kid. Behave... You'll all stay alive. There's plenty of work to do and plenty of information you can give us. You think we tell you anything? People always do. Look how we were able to find out about this little junk of the Cowans. And time for me to stow away and stop them. How did you find out? Never mind. We're just smarter than the solar guard, that's all. Like I'm smarter than you. Smarter than us? Why, you ain't face dim with it. Wait, Roger. Maybe he's right. I don't like the way you're talking, Junior. He's just getting wised up. Maybe he is smarter, Roger. Anyway, he's got the gun, and you've got to admit it looks as if we're licked. Hey, Roger. What do you want, quitter? Aren't we getting badly off course out of the space lane? What's that? Haven't you noticed, Roger? No, I haven't. It's your job to check our orbit, Roger. Do you want us to get into trouble? Yeah, how about that? What's wrong, Carver? Well, take a look at the stars out there. Doesn't the pattern look wrong to you? Stars? Well, they look about like always. Uh, maybe a little funny. Sure, it's obvious we're off course. Look at the relative position of Vega, for instance. Vega? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Vega. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we're in trouble. Listen, Roger, it must be the cosmic drift. Cosmic drift? You got space junk in your head, or is this... Space junk, you're right, Roger. That's the danger. That's not what I said. Absolutely. I... Cosmic drift could carry us right out of the clear space lane into the tombstone area. Hey, I'm right about that. We can r really get clobbered by space junk there. That's right, Roger. Anything could happen there. Anything. Huh? Oh, uh, it sure could. 
You got any su- suggestions for escaping this uh, cosmic drift, huh? Well, you got to settle with wise guy. Now get us out of it. And fast, I'll put the freeze on you. Hold on. Roger has to navigate. Okay, but get going. Our course is starboard, isn't it, Roger? That's right. An eight degree sweep should put us about right. Then I'll give you more correction. Yeah, get back where we belong fast and stay there this time. Oh, young punk can put anything over on me. I've had my lesson. I know what I'm doing now. Yep, we'll do just what you say. Now, come on, Roger. If we work fast, everything ought to turn out all right. Look what I'm picking up on the radar screen, Junior. Let me see, Roger. Uh Uh-oh. What now? A big piece of space junk right in our path. And some hunk of rock, big as a mountain. Well, that cosmic drift sure threw us off. Now, come on, do something. Well, I'm going to try, you can bet. Gosh, that thing's close. And listen to the blips. Why, they're building up. We'll we'll be into it in a minute. Come on, get them over. I'm trying, but this is an emergency. We need to blast on the steering rockets. Roger, get down to the power deck, right? No, stay right here where I can watch your boat. Well, then we can't work the steering blast. Pull out with the controls. Impossible. Can't you see? I'm trying. There's a warning signal. We'll smash. Let me go down. No, call it. Get us out of this or I'll shoot. Well, if we don't get out, there'll be nobody to shoot. Shut off the power. That'll make it worse. No thrust. I can't get out of the way. Last you, you're not trying. Maybe you could do better. Yeah, I could. Let me hit those controls. Okay, take them. And this, too. Knocked them cold, Tom. Nice going. Yeah, it was a snap. I... Hit him on the control lever. That piece of space junk really had him worried. How far away is it, really? Far enough to be safe. That was a great bluff you put up, Tom, struggling at the controls without moving them. Yeah. You did a nice job with the enlargement control, too, building up the picture and the blips. But it was the warning bell that really scared him. How'd you set that off, anyway? Shorted the wires. And, uh, Tom, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't trust you before. Skip it. Let's get out of here. Don't forget, we are in the tombstone area now. I'll just start to sweep back to port and lose that space mountain out there. Right. Oh, it's gone. Cosmic drift. Oh, brother. Hey, let's unfreeze the colonel with this gun. Thanks. That was rough. Seeing, hearing everything but being helplessly paralyzed. I'll admit I didn't catch on to what you were up to, Tom, until Roger started to play along. Smart work, Junior. Pretending to put us back on course and heading for this space junkyard instead. Anyway, it worked. Now we have to reset our orbit to Rhea. Sir, will you go down and unfreeze Astro? You bet. Give me the gun. Hey, Roger. The radar, didn't you turn the game down? Yeah, something really is coming. Jumping Jupiter, trying to dodge, Tom. Okay. It's a small piece, but right on top of us. Look out! Great galaxy. It must have gone right through the ship. And I shorted out the bell. It would have warned us in time. The rockets are dead. The space junk must have hit the power deck. And Astro's down there, still paralyzed. Come on, we've got to find out if he's hurt. How is he, Colonel? He'll be all right, Tom. You sure, sir? Yes, there's no fracture. But that piece of metal gave him a hard clout just the same. He'll be unconscious for several hours. How about ship damage? Bad, sir. We sealed up the holes in the hull easily enough, stopped the air loss... But the rockets... Well, it's hard to believe one crummy little hunk of stone could tear things up like that. How soon can we make repairs? Well, Astro's the mechanical whiz. Yes, he could patch it up in a few hours. We'll have to go more slowly. How long? Oh, well, maybe half a day. Faster if Astro comes through in time to help. Half a day without power? You realize what that means? Yes, sir, we sure do. It means we'll never get to Rhea in time to stop that raid. <laughs> We'll return to the exciting adventures of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, in just a moment, so stand by. The Hydra blasts off for a patrol around Saturn's ring. Space freighter Lexus blasts off with a cargo for Mercury. Space cruiser Draco blasts off on a mercy mission to Venus. One after another, ships from Space Academy hurtle out into the far-flung regions of space. And now here is the one man responsible for the perfect execution of these operations, the Commandant of Space Academy, Commander Arkwright. Spaceman, you can take my word for it. Every man on those spaceships is equipped with an official pair of space goggles. I wouldn't allow a man out into space without a pair. You see, space goggles protect a cadet's eyes when he's rocketing through space. And they'll help protect your eyes when you're heading into the glaring sun or 
bucking a strong headwind. You will find dozens of good uses for your pair of space goggles. They're made of one sweeping curved piece of colored plastic, and they fit comfortably over both eyes. So, spacemen, send for your goggles right away. Listen carefully and write down these instructions. Here's what you do. Send 25 cents, one box top from Kellogg's Pep, and your name and address. That's 25 cents, one box top from Kellogg's Pep, and your name and address. Send to this address. Kellogg's, Box 346, Battle Creek, Michigan. Kellogg's, Box 346, Battle Creek, Michigan. Spaceman, write for your official space goggles today. And be sure to eat the Spaceman's breakfast. Kellogg's Pep, that swell-tasting, build-up wheat cereal. By pretending that the Polaris was about to collide with a huge mass of space junk, Tom and Roger managed to trick their captor, regain control of the ship, and release Colonel Cowan. However, the trick backfired when a smaller piece of rock tore through the Polaris and knocked out the main drive. With the cruiser drifting powerless and ace mechanic Astro unconscious from the accident, it now appears that they will be unable to stop the gang's raid on Rhea, the satellite of light. You boys were right. This is hopeless. We just don't have the know-how to do a quick repair job. But we can't give up, Colonel. Of course not. But this way's too slow. We're not doing so bad, sir. This mess is beginning to look like a power system again. A little, Manning. But we can't gamble on it. Maybe Astro will come too sooner than you figured. It's still a gamble. And remember, thousands of lives are at stake, including my wife's. Then we'll have to notify the Solar Guard over our audio channel. No. If we break audio silence, we'd be notifying the criminals, too. They're probably tuned to our frequency right now. Oh, suppose they did hear us. What could they do? Move faster than they planned. They'd hit Rhea, grab the F3 viricide, wipe out the plants, and get away. If there were only some way. Sir, wait a minute. There's the jet boat. Go from here to Rhea in that flivver? We are pretty far away, but there's a possibility. It might work. You said you didn't want to gamble, sir, and this is the biggest gamble I can think of. Jet boats don't carry that much fuel. Just the same, I'm going. You'll need a pilot, sir. I'll go along. Thanks, Corbett, but I couldn't ask you to do that. You didn't ask me, sir. I volunteered. Roger, you keep at the rocket. Sure, but I... When Astro comes to, he can help. And when you get the ship fixed, follow us to Rio. All right, all right. Don't worry about it. But this jet boat junket is plain crazy. It has to be done, Roger. You know that. And suppose you do make it. What can two men do against a gang with a spaceship? He's right, Corbett. It's a long shot. Better let me go alone. No, sir. At least two men have a better chance than one. And as long as there's any chance at all, we have to try. Right, sir? Right. All right, then, Colonel. Let's go. <laughs> Sir, there's Rio below us. I didn't think we'd ever see this place. Listen to those jets. They're nearly finished. Hill's about gone. If I hadn't happened to hit it right... It didn't just happen. You're a fine pilot. Thanks, sir. We're close enough now to take a look through the glasses and see what's happening. I have them here. I'm almost afraid to look. The gang is already hit and run. Well, here goes. Great Jupiter. What's wrong, sir? Nothing. Nothing at all. Men at work, just as usual. We're in time. Well, thank goodness. I'll tell you the truth now, sir. I didn't think we had a chance. And neither did I. The gang must be holding off, waiting to hear from their man on the Polaris. I guess we've been pretty lucky, sir. Well, we don't need much more luck now. Just a little and our mission will be accomplished. Rhea's precious medicine will be saved for the people of the entire universe. the next action-packed episode with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, on Thursday when Tom and Captain Cowan find that treachery awaits them on Rhea in part two of The Satellite of Death. Tune in same time, same station on Thursday for the next thrilling interplanetary adventure with Tom Corbett, Space Cadet. Brought to you by Kellogg's Pep, the build-up wheat cereal. Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, starring Frankie Thomas, can also be seen on television and appears in the comic sections of many of America's leading newspapers. 
Look for it daily and in weekend editions. Featured in today's cast were Jan Merlin and Neil O'Malley. Today's program was written by Don Hughes, directed by Drex Hines. Jackson Beck speaking. Kellogg's Raisin Bran, Raisins and Bran Flakes too. They're out of this world, they're out of one package. Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Kellogg's Raisins are honeycomb coated to keep them tender. The Bran Flakes crisper. Kellogg's Raisin Bran, Raisins and Bran Flakes too. They're out of this world, they're out of one package. Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Eat Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Eat Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Eat Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are kneeling in the church of a Caribbean village, seeking the sanctuary it might offer, while slowly walking down the aisle... Carefully studying each bowed head is the brute of a man who has come to kill you. Listen now as Escape brings you Les Crutchfield's story, Violent Night. Suddenly, wide awake. It's a trick you learn around the back countries of the Caribbean. If you want to stay alive. I didn't move. I didn't make a sound. Just stared into the darkness and listened. And then it came again. Somebody was on the veranda. I slid off the cot. Reached for my pistol on the table and stood up. Barefooted, I moved quietly across the room and stopped by the shutters. Senora Crazy. Who is it? Pepita. It is Pepita. Pepita? I am come to warn you of terrible danger. Are you alone? Yes. All right, wait a second. Quickly. What's wrong? What's the matter? Look. Toward the village. Toward Monte Miguel. What? What? Fire. What's burning? The estacion of the police. The Federalista army barrack. Other places. It is a revolution, senor. Revolution? Who is it? Who's behind it? Alacran. What? He has come out of the jungle again. One thousand men are following him. And now more from the village. He has guns, trucks, cars, radios. He is called himself governor of the district. Governor? He won't last 48 hours. Everyone say it is revolution all over the country. You must leave your plantation and go quickly. But, Peter, you, uh, you think he still remembers? Alacran will never forget. Not ever. Not before one of you is dead. Yeah, maybe you're right. All right, thanks, Peter. Thanks for everything. Ten minutes later, I lay hidden in a clump of bamboo by the irrigation ditch, 30 yards from my house, watching a convoy of army trucks swing in from the highway and roar up the road toward the plantation. I could have struck out then, run away, but I had to know the odds, know whether Alacran was making it personal, whether he still remembered. 
The trucks skidded to a stop. Men with rifles piled out, circled the house. Spotlights cut through the night, lit up my bungalow, probing at the shutters. But I didn't see him until he stepped into the circle of lights and called out. Mr. Gravy? Mr. Barry O'Gravy? Alacron. You're wasting our time, Mr. O'Gravy. You may as well come out. Educated in the States, but as cunning and cruel as the wildest Indian in the bush. Are you afraid of me, Mr. O'Grady? Are you afraid to come out and greet an old friend who has not forgotten you for a minute? Alacron, leader of a revolution, self-styled governor of the district. And he'd taken time out to lead this raid personally. Yes, Pepito was right. He hadn't forgotten. He blasted the bolt off my door with a Tommy gun, and then with a half a dozen of his men, he plunged into the house. It was time to get out. I'd wanted to know the odds, and now I knew them. I didn't have a chance. I ran for nearly two miles, through my coffee groves, along the banks of the ditches, through the patches of bush, before I finally played off. I was beside a narrow road leading back into the hills. I dropped down to the edge of it and tried to get my wind back. Helicron. For two years he'd waited. And now he was coming after me. He'd been trying to start a revolt then. I'd dragged him away from my workmen, taken his gun away from him, and beaten him to a pulp. And now he was back in control of the whole district with a wolf pack at his heels. And then suddenly I I noticed the headlights of a car coming down the road from the hills. The lights were too close together and too low to the ground for an army truck. There were ranches up in the hills, resorts. It might be a private car. It was worth a chance. I worked feverishly. The car was close now and moving fast. I gave it an armful of brush, threw it into the road, struck a match and set fire to it. And then I dropped down in the ditch and waited. All right, easy now. Don't move. Who are you? What do you want? I want your car. No, it is impossible. Let me go. Oh, no, you don't. Let go of that. Stop it. Stop it. You're hurting me. Take your hands off. Thanks. Well, that's a lot of gun for a lady. Well, we'll take care of that. You fool. Do you know who I am? No. I am the daughter of the governor of this district. You're what? It's true. I am the daughter. I'd heard he had a daughter, but who'd ever expect that fat pig to have one that looks like you? I promise you, senor. If you go on with this, I will see that you are shot against the wall. <laughs> You're too late. Your father already has that idea. Or more likely a worse one. Huh. You know, I think you're going to come in awfully handy before morning. If you think you What do I going... call you? What's your name? Maria. All right, Maria, let's get this straight. I got one chance in a thousand of staying alive, and if I can help that chance, I'll do anything. You understand? No, please. Now, we're going to get out of here. We're going to get out together, whatever happens. Your father gets me, and I get you. All right, now get the car started. We came off the side road two miles from Monte Miguel, crossed the main highway, and took the old road toward San Vicente. It was 110 miles to the capital, but the sports car was fast. It could outrun any army vehicle Alcatraz's men might have. And there was a good chance he hadn't yet blockaded the San Vicente Highway. Well, it was a good dream. It lasted for two miles, and then it popped like a soap bubble. In the road ahead, senor, lights, trucks, men moving... What do you want me to do? Brakes. Hit the brakes. Come on. And get this thing turned around and make it fast. Get it. Amigos. See? See? All right. Come on. Step on it. Let's get out of here. Come on. Master. Oh, that was close. Plenty close. Well, we're still like we could have barred straight into that. Well, they blocked us, but at least they didn't get us. And we still got a chance of circling back. But, what? What's wrong? What is it? I don't know. I'm not doing anything. Yeah, wait a minute. 
Yeah, yeah, I can smell it. The bullet must have oh. smashed up in the gas tank. Wait, we're out of petrol? Yeah, get it over to the side. Right. No farther. Clear over to the canal bank. The irrigation ditch. Go on. All right. Come on, get out. Come on. Hurry. What are we going to do? Here, give me a hand. We're going to get it rolling. Come on. Into the ditch. Come on, let's go. Here. What do you mean? They'll be along here any second. Find where we sank the car. Come after us. We don't have much time. Now, come on. Let's get across that ditch. In the water? No. I will not do it. I will not go into the water. Oh, you won't. Huh? All right. Uh, put me down. Put me down. Stop. Hold your breath. <laughs> now, just take it easy. Quit fighting and relax, will you? I'll get you across. It's only 20 feet wide. All right, easy now. All right, here we go. Now grab the back. Oh, it just takes me all my life. I'm going to kill you. Maybe not. I might have to kill you first. Now, come on. I am not going into that jungle with you. No matter what you do to me, I am not going. Come on, move. Alacran had outmaneuvered me, outflanked me. There was no use trying to break south toward the capital. He had the whole area sewed up. So I decided on a gamble. I turned back, head for the last place on earth he'd look for me. The village of Monte Miguel itself. It was nearly midnight when we entered the village. I kept a tight grip on Maria's arm and hurried her through the back streets and alleys, heading toward Pepita's room on the other side of town. Though we didn't make it, a patrol of rebels came around the corner and moved toward us. We couldn't turn and run. We couldn't go on. We were trapped. But we'd stopped in front of a house built flush against the street. The door was only a few feet away. I stepped over and tried it. It was unlocked. I drew my gun and pushed the door open. All right, come on. There's no one in. Inside, quick. What are you going to do? Wait for the patrol to pass. <gasps> now be quiet. Here they come. Not a sound, Marie. Shh. Quiet. Oh, that was lucky. Well, <laughs> double lucky, in fact. Now, the head man here has gone out and left some clothes all ready for me. Oh, pantalones, camisa, sarape, sombrero. Oh, now, if we can find something for you... What do you mean? Well, dress like we are, we don't have a chance. Ah, here. Here, this ought to do it. Catch it. Now, here's a shawl for you. You can throw it over your head and keep it around your face. If you think I am going to change my clothes... Get behind that curtain and do it any way you want, but get into that dress and do it fast. In a few minutes, we were back into the marketplace, walking rapidly. And then as we passed the great doors of the church, I froze in my tracks. (gasps) Alecron. He was launching in the back of a touring car, fat and evil. This way. Quick. Enter the church. If he sees me, we're finished. Slow and solemn, though. All right, up the steps. And keep your head down. Awed, half scared the way the villagers go in. All right. Up toward the front. pressed against your side. Keep your head down and pretend you're praying. Better yet, really pray. (laughs) 
You are listening to Violent Night, tonight's presentation on Escape. Next Monday night on CBS Radio, Ronald Reagan stars in the Lux Radio Theater adaptation of Carbine Williams with Wendell Corey and Gene Hagen in their original screen roles. Next Monday night, when you will also want to hear Tyrone Power in Suspense's production, The Guilty Always Run. And now, Escape and the second act of Violent Night. The padre, white-haired and old, knelt at the altar and went on with his prayer, not hearing the summons from the back of the church. Some of the kneeling villagers turned to look and then turned back quickly. Beneath my serape, I kept the gun pressed tight against Maria's side. Padre! Alecran was walking up the aisle toward the front of the church, moving slowly and deliberately, stopping to glance along each row and study the kneeling worshippers. You cannot come here with arms, my son. This is a place of peace. Oh, and I am a very peaceful man, Padre, as long as I have not denied the things I want. What is it you want? A man. I am told there has some woman with him. They may have come in here... I will only need a moment more to finish checking your followers. No, I cannot permit that. Padre, you know who I am. Now, we can be friends or we can be enemies, as you choose. Of course, burning the church is not to my liking. Go. Wait outside if you wish. I am on the point of dismissing the congregation. You may watch them as they leave. All right. You're clever at compromise, Padre. I'm sure we will learn to understand each other. Adios. La misa está terminada. That is all, my children. Vayan con Dios. My son. What is it, Padre? This way. Follow me, both of you. Come quickly. Come on, Maria. Yes. In here. You're taking a big chance, Padre, if he finds out you're in trouble. You have heard of sanctuary, my son, the sanctuary of the church? Yes, of course. Unfortunately, I cannot assure you that sanctuary, but perhaps I can help you in some small way to find your own sanctuary. Thank you, Padre. In a few minutes, when everyone has gone, he will be certain. <coughs> Who is it? Lalakran. One moment. I am informed that you are hiding a man and woman from the congregation. Open this door. Have patience. Now. Here, behind the desk, there is a way out. All right. Go now, both of you, quickly. The passage opens on an alleyway behind the church. Open now. Hurry, my children. Thank you, Father. Que vayan con Dios. When we came into the open alleyway, we were on the very edge of the village on a crooked path that ran between the walls and backs of the buildings on one side and the dark, dense mass of the Valle Diablo jungle on the other. But for a moment, we were safe. Barry. What? Back there, in the church, would you really have killed me? Look, I'd hate to do anything to hurt you, but if I have to, I will. Why do you hate me so hate much? Hate you? I don't hate you. Why should I hate you? You're my ace in the hole. I've got nothing against you personally. You just picked the wrong man for a father, that's all. Alfredo! Wait. Hold it. Alfredo! Barry, don't shoot. It's only a child. Yes, it's only a child, but he knows who we are. And you'll have the whole town out here in two minutes. There's no choice left. Now, come on. Barry, what are you doing? Where are we going? Into the jungle. Into the Valle Diablo. Yes. I got to rest. It can't go on much further. All right. All right, Maria. We'll, we'll slow down and take it easier. I don't think he's going to find us now. I think maybe we've got a chance. Can't we stop there? No. No, in ten minutes we, 
we wouldn't be able to move again. Now the sky's beginning to lighten. It'll be dawn in less than an hour. He can't chase us forever. He's got a revolution on his hands. Barry, it's all been so strange, like a nightmare, all mixed up. I hated you at first. Oh, forget it. I didn't know who you were, what you were doing to me. And finally, I began to understand. I... I don't hate you anymore, Barry. Good, Maria. It works out better that way. In fact, I'm afraid I... I like you very much. What? Afraid... Maria, we'll be out of this before long, and what? Wait. What is it, Barry? There's the dogs. What? Yeah, they're trailing us with dogs. No matter where we go now, they'll find us. Oh, Barry! Come on, Maria. Oh, and we ran again down the twisting jungle trail, on and on, knowing while we ran that there was no way out, no way of escape. And then suddenly we burst out into a clearing and stopped in our tracks. For ahead of us, dark and ancient, its stones worn by tropic rains, grown over with lichen and moss, was a Mayan pyramid built by men dead for centuries, lost and forgotten in the Valle Diablo. We broke into a run across the clearing. We are going... Inside, Barry? Oh, why not? What have we got to lose? Nothing at all, Mr. Lady. Holy crap. All right, inside, quick, Marie. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Right into the trap, just as I hoped. He's behind us somewhere. At the edge of the clearing. I've been here for some time, you know, waiting for my beaters to drive you out of the brush. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always predictable. Mr. O'Grady. One knows precisely what you are going to do before you do it. <laughs> I like Bron. Listen to me. I've got Maria with me. Oh, I recognize her at once. Then listen. Before I let you take me, I'll kill her. Do you understand? That's entirely up to you, Mr. O'Grady. <laughs> First you fire at my voice and me. Then an empty gun. Embarrassing, isn't it, Mr. O'Grady? Now my fun begins. Come on, Maria, back inside, quick. Well, I'm out of cartridges. All we can do now is run. Run as far and as long as we can. And then what, Barry? You killed me. As you told him you would. You know better. I thought the threat would hold him off, but it didn't. You heard him. Yes. I heard him. It is not a surprise, Barry. My father has hated me for years. I did not come in handy like you hoped. Where are you, Mr. Reddy? Are you scared now? Running? Maria, keep, yes. keep moving as quiet as possible. Uh, maybe you did something to help you run, Mr. O'Grady. <laughs> He's got a machine pistol. Hurry. I cannot go so quickly. What are you afraid of, Mr. O'Grady? You're not afraid that they are the plantation. Is this what bothers you for us? <laughs> It's no use. Maria, Maria, wait. There's a ledge right above us here. I can feel it when I reach up. Broken boulders. Now, there's a chance. Now, listen to me, Maria. You go on alone. Oh. Make a noise. Talk so that he'll think that we're still together. Do you understand? I'm going to wait for him here. Right up on that ledge. All right, now, go on. All right. Go on. But, oh, oh be careful. Be very careful. <laughs> I scrambled up on the ledge and got set. 
And I felt around in the dark and found a rock as big as a man's head. And then I waited. You're tiring yourself for nothing, Mr. O'Grady. There's only one way out, you know. This way. I raised the rock and waited. He was close now, very close. I listened to his steps, trying to judge his position by the sound. You're not being very friendly, Mr. O'Grady, and I feel very warm for you. He was right below me. <laughs> I raised the rock and smashed it down on his head. <laughs> it's all right, Maria. It's all over. Maria. Two weeks in that stinking jail, and now you drag me out and bring me down here to the harbor. Why, Captain? This way, Senor Agreed. All right, so you won the revolution. Now you're the new government. All right, fine. I got nothing against you. My fight with Alecran was personal. You know that. Quite true, Senor Grady. I know that. However, Alecran was one of our leaders. You killed him. The usual sentence is death by a firing squad. I know that, Captain. They but... said we are permitting you to leave the country. The launch is waiting to take you out to the ship. You should consider yourself very fortunate, Senor Grady. Captain. Look. There, uh... Th there was a girl. Maria. Alecran's daughter. Where is Maria? I believe you're speaking of my wife, senor. Your wife? You are escaping a death sentence, senor. But I must warn you that if you ever return to the Republic, that sentence will be carried out. Your wife? Maria and I were married yesterday at the Church of Santa Isabel. As a wedding gift to Maria, I gave her... Your life. Your ship is waiting, Senor Grady. Adios. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you Violent Night by Les Crutchfield, starring William Conrad and Joyce McCluskey. Featured in the cast were Don Diamond, Ben Wright, and Edgar Barrier, with Michael Ann Barrett, Byron Kane, and Richard Beals. Your announcer, George Walsh. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are standing in a lonely forest clearing. The dawn turned gray by the creeping fog. While standing only yards from you, his eyes filled with his hate for you, is a man who's come to take your life. Unless you first take his. So listen next week when Escape brings you Alexander Dumas' classic story, The Second Shot. Rich in comedy, rich in human interest, rich in novelty. That's Rich, starring Stan Freeberg, Friday nights on CBS Radio. It's the lively, refreshing Stars Address situation comedy called That's Rich, which it certainly is, every Friday night on most of these stations. Just you make a date, tie a little string around your favorite chair so you'll remember to listen, and laugh with That's Rich. Friday nights, too, enjoy a full hour Arthur Godfrey Digest on the CBS Radio Network.
the American Broadcasting Company Radio Network presents Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Mission to daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are aboard the Terra 5, rushing toward the planet Saturn. Suddenly, another ship fires at them. Oh, it was close, Commander. He's getting drained with those torpedoes. They'll fire basic action. Why don't we give this off from his own medicine? Fire a few blasts with our space cannon. We can't see. We've got to think about those people in Saturn City. If we destroy Drokov, we destroy the only person who can cure that epidemic. Take a rocket. We can't fight back. So all Drokov has to do is keep firing until he hits us. We'll be back in a moment with the exciting story, The Weed of Despair. Better schools build better communities. All schools should have large, airy classrooms, well-equipped, and even more important, they should have an adequate teaching staff. Many of our schools fail to reach these standards. Three out of every five classrooms in the nation are overcrowded, and there's a shortage of 72,000 elementary teachers. The solution is more action by more people in more places. Join and work with local civic groups and school boards who are actively seeking to improve educational conditions. Find out how citizens in other communities are taking action to improve their schools. For such background information and for guidance, simply write to Better Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York 36, New York. Help our schools keep pace with the birth rate. Now, back to today's exciting Space Patrol adventure, The Weed of Despair. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are aboard the Terra 5, bound for the planet Saturn to investigate a strange malady that has afflicted Saturn City. Leading doctors of the United Planets are unable to explain the cause of the sickness, which leaves its victims suffering from strange fatigue and anxiety. Many of the city's leaders have been affected by the spreading epidemic, and Buzz fears that immediate action is needed to prevent a serious disaster. If the doctors can't do anything about it, but what are we supposed to do? Our well, job is to keep the people of Saturn City from hurting themselves and others. Well, I've read in the medical report, sir, nobody gets violent. It's the opposite of that. They, they just sit around and do and worry. Exactly. Every motion seems a tremendous effort for them to use the system. As the sickness progresses, they become afraid to take any sort of action for fear it might be the wrong thing to do. Then it's all in their mind. Yes, sir. That doesn't make the effect of the sickness any less real. I still don't see how we can. Setting up a temporary camp outside the city in a small atmosphere cell. In case Saturn City has to be quarantined, we can rotate skeleton crews in two positions and operate the city by remote control. We could reach Saturn in about two hours, and we just over the orbit of the sixth moon, Titan. Titan, the sixth moon of Saturn, is the only satellite in the solar system with a natural atmosphere. Prospectors like Mort Stockler and Reese Haviland, with little money for space suits or small atmosphere shells, Take advantage of this fact in their search for valuable minerals. A small, powerful surface truck roars over Titan's rough terrain. I skip right over that hill, Lee. I think you're rocking. Flash is in the sky. Flash is over the hill. I got swamp. Please, my Yeah, yeah. The polka dots. Yeah. No, there wasn't any polka dots. Like I told you, I was looking out the window of our shack when the first flash came across the space. Media. And then several minutes later, the next one came. That's when it exploded and hit the ground. If it exploded, it isn't going to do us any good, even if it was solid uranium. No. Look, you can see it now. That's where it landed, that, that big scarred place a quarter of a mile ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's all black and yeah. But it wasn't a meteor, and a meteor we'd have thought it's crazy. It's been burned, it's burned hot. It's something burned hot. Without a command, land on the ground. Run right over here. That's how I was cut to do it wrong. Throw him over now. Can't tell where he's beating him out. He's pushing him out. Oh, he's been right here in the lane. Whatever it's full of the rare chunk of the hypocrite. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, you're right, all right. Yeah, I don't believe this went into the truck. You better rush into the shack and buck him up. 
two prospectors speed back to their shack with the injured man. While they're dressing the room, the stranger regains consciousness. Now, you just lie there and don't take it easy. Well, have your packs up for you. Oh, you gentlemen saved my life. I was sure I was finished. Oh, you're going to be all right. Maybe it's just a thing. I'll be up there. All right. Uh, a couple of miles away, I'll get you up. How did you have your friend? I saw the price of medium made it. It wasn't either, was it? No, it, it was my ship, my private cruiser. Something went wrong with the reactor. I managed to sit down and get out before it blew up. Striking Mr. Captain's leg. You were lucky at that. By the way, my name is Reeve Havlin. My beetle Brad Ken here is more stocker. Or prospector, in case you haven't guessed. I'm very glad to know you, Captain. I'm, uh, my name is Yellow. I'm a convenience. Oh, yes, I'm a plant apologist. The kind of fact that you were thinking. I'm afraid I didn't make myself quite clear. I wish was going to find flowers and bees. Well, Mr. Gowan, you won't find any plants on paper. I can expect that. My landing here was kind of nice. That's it. You said you can probably get around a lot. Maybe you can help me. Would you be good enough to bring me my jacket? I'm sure I could. I'm searching for a certain type of plant. I need to be exact. Yeah, that you'd know it. Well, I might. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Well, that's too fancy. But I haven't talked to it quite like these before. It's a semi-official uniform. Here's what I wanted to show you. These two plants. Did you ever see one of these plants? Uh, no. I think I would do. Let me see them. Uh, oh. You mean you're looking for a mangy-looking weed like this? Well, I admit it's not very attractive. But it uh, has interesting medical uses. Think carefully. Have you ever seen it? Well, as you can see, it's soft as a gray jelly. Once a year, it grows a big purple ball of pond to its door. Uh, see, he probably said it. No, Mr. Gilman, I have never seen anything like this. Here you are. And this is what you're looking for, huh? Oh, you just stand it on tight and out of ship, Mr. Gilman. We'd be glad to notify the Saturn Space Patrol. Uh, no. I mean, uh, I don't bother. Well, it's not a trouble. We've got a paper for him. The fact is, I feel rather foolish asking for a rescue ship. We'll probably be going to start in for supplies in a day or so. I'll be in with you. We don't have a ship here on Titan, Mr. Gamble. Are you sure? We're prospecting uh, on the truck, so to speak. A big company advances supplies and equipment. And every 30 days, we send a ship there to drop off more supplies. Then we'll pick up staff of the war. We won't be late till the ship turns. You're welcome. And uh, how, how long will that be? The last ship was here two days ago. Maybe uh, 28 days ago. Don't let the boy. We've got plenty of food. And he's helping to stay with us. You know, you just lie down there and take it easy while I rustle up some food for you. There's something pretty strange in the deep set tonight. Victoria aboard Terra 5, the Titan Station C19. Go ahead. This is Reese Pavlin, Titan C19. I want to report it. That's a glory. That's right, Havlin. I'm 11 years off Titan. What's the trouble? My partner and I prospect in Sector 7R on Titan. Somebody stole our surface. We're stranded. Can you give me more details, Havlin? Sure. Uh, a couple of hours ago, a spaceship exploded just over the hill from our shack. My partner and I picked up this guy and brought him back. Space was searched. Say a spaceship exploded? Well, it uh, blew off after it crashed. It's got the big black meter and nothing else. Uh, anyhow, we picked up the pilot and put him in our box. Say tonight. The next thing we knew, he was gone. And so was our truck. How long ago did this happen? It's uh, not more than 20 minutes ago. He couldn't have gone very far. But me and my partner are well, take it easy, Havlin. We're covering the whole area by viewscope right now. We can to get that truck back to the jury. It's our bread and butter. Stand by that space for me. Keep in touch. Hurry out. Remember, pick up something on the vehicle. Maybe it'll fill himself. Put the lower deck right now. 
This is a popular line. When closer observation proves the moving object to be a surface truck, Buzz lands the terrified near the blackened area. By now, the surface truck has stopped near some large rocks. Buzz is happy to send the landing ladder in advance toward the truck. A man in strange clothing turns from a crevice in the rock and stands with arms folded, waiting. Space Patrol, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Of course. Where did you get that surface? We got a couple of parts of it. What started in these cabins? I suppose they reported a stone. Thanks. Actually, I only borrowed it. I figured I'd get back to the shaft before they missed the truck or me. Why are you here? Looking for something? Yes, I am. You see, I have some valuable personal effects on my safety. I have hoped to be a clear by the explosion. So I'll come back to look for it. Yes? Find what you were looking for? Place of the hall, the active field, and uh, yet we escaped. I could do it on the I was fortunate. I managed to get clear of the ship before it blew up. That's that. Kelvin, are you sure that you didn't manage to save a portable space upon from the ship before it exploded? Uh, I, uh, it's a cold, yeah? A very strong cold. Uh, it's the kind of magic picked up by a rapid space receiver. What do you mean? Kelvin, I think you're from another solar system. One of the solar systems. You think that? The clothes are one thing. And your spaceship is so totally and mysteriously demolished. And if I get a look at that receiver, I can tell that it was made here an hour or so this way. Uh, I am from another. I don't mean you any harm. In fact, I came here to help you, please. We can settle that discussion with a vendor. Can you regret this? Are you sure whether you're telling the truth? You can tell it happy when I cut that receiver. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, the signal cut off. Yeah, I'm glad that you knew. Yeah? So just how are you going to stop it? I hate to do this, but it's quite simple. Oh, I think you're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Use your radar. Of course you can. This harmless looking belt is radiating a field of hundreds of them. Come on. We'll return to our exciting space patrol adventure in just a moment. One of the great men of our time is Dr. Albert Schweitzer. For the past 40 years, Dr. Schweitzer has dedicated his life to his medical mission in French Equatorial Africa, devoting all his personal income to the support of 700 patients suffering from leprosy, malaria, sleeping sickness, and other dread diseases of the jungle. Dr. Schweitzer has just reached his 80th birthday. As a tribute, many Americans will send him a gift through care. Because help for Dr. Schweitzer's hospital is one continuing part of CARE's World Health Program. Your contribution will be gratefully received and carefully spent in the service of humanity. Send it to CARE, New York 16, or to any local CARE office. Specify that it is for Dr. Schweitzer's hospital in Africa. Now back to our exciting space patrol adventure, Weed of Despair. Buzz and Happy landed on Titan. Sat in six moon near a strange scarred area where a spaceship disintegrated in an explosion. While questioning Jeldon, the pilot who survived the disaster, Buzz found evidence that the ship is from another solar system. Suddenly, Jeldon stunned the space patroller with a brain numbing field that radiated from his belt. Now, Buzz and Happy find themselves in the control compartment of the terrifying with Jeldon standing over them. Now, if your heads are clear, I want you to listen. Understand? We've got our weapons, we can't do anything else. I'm from Tolome, a star system about 80 light years from your solar system. I'm an officer in our Galactic Peace Commission. It's on the order of your state patrol. I can point out a few differences. Perhaps. I'm here to capture an escape criminal. Well, if you're the law, I'd hate to meet the criminal. I know you're angry. But it was necessary for the welfare of your own people. So to help people, you put us out cold with that radiation field. I'm trying to take me to your state patrol headquarters, you said. It would take time, and there's none to spare. Not when I have a lead on Dokken. He is so The criminal ran after After he fled from Paloma, I trailed him to the cosine system. And then here. I had intercepted a hyperspace signal from him when my ship developed trouble. I had to land on Titan. 
I saw it in my own ship, so Gokoff couldn't spot it. Well, what does this Gokoff do that's so dangerous? He brings the entire planet under his control. How does he work? I want to show you some pictures. Did you ever see a plant like this anywhere in your solar system? I said, I'm sorry. How about you, Hopper? Oh, no, sir. I think so. This weed is probably the most dangerous plant in the universe. It looks harmless, but just a few of them can pollute the atmosphere for miles around. You mean it's poison? Well, not in the ordinary physical sense. Its effect is emotional or psychological. You see this purple sack, the pod? Mm-hmm. When that pod bursts, billions of microscopic spores are released into the air. Many of the spores are breathed by human beings with strange sicknesses to them. The kind of sickness, the great lassitude, the fatigue. The victim is overcome with a sense of hopelessness. And nothing seems worthwhile. Then comes a horrible anxiety, a formless, baseless worry, and a sense of despair. Saturn City. That's exactly what's happening in Saturn City. What is Brokaw's purpose? How can he profit by it? Brokaw also has the only cure for this sickness. When your scientists have tried every possible remedy and failed, and the government and its citizens become panicky, and Brokaw will offer his cure at an enormous price. But there is a cure, a positive, definite cure. Yes. Tell us what it is. With your help, our scientists could prepare it and rush it to Saturn City. And it's not as easy as that, Commander. Years ago, the government of Columbus destroyed every weed on the planet where it originated. The remedy is destroyed with the weed. How? Oh. You see, a species of wasp feeds on a substance secreted by the stalk of the plant. When the weeds are killed, the wasp had no more food and died out. Well, what's the wasp got to do with the cure? An extract is made from the honey of the wasp. That substance counteracts the effects of the force, and only broke out past this extract. That's right, Commander. And the supply of the plant. Then you're willing to join forces with us to capture Brokaw? Not only willing, but eager. Fine. It means our ship and your knowledge. The first is that truck you uh, borrow from the two prospectors. How far away is that ship? About one tour. That will be less than two miles from your measurement limits. I'll space one of the prospectors and tell them where the truck is. I'll tell them I've arrested the man. That's fine, Commander. The sooner we go after Brokaw, the better. Where do we start looking for him? I only know he's somewhere in this part of your solar system. We'll head to Saturn City and make a few inquiries. Prepare for blast off, Pat. I'll contact Mort Stocker. Blasting off from the sixth moon was such a victory for the planet Saturn. Now the terrified of the few hundred BU to the outer perimeter of Saturn's ring. And the magnificent sight commander, those rings on Saturn, yes. they are beautiful, then. And from this angle, the rings look smooth and flat. One might even be tempted to try to land on them. If you tried it, your ship would be chewed to pieces in a fraction of a second. Those rings are made up of tiny fragments of rock whirling around Saturn at about ten miles a second. Commander, look at the rear view plate. There's a ship right on our tail. There's a collision course, but we'd better warn him. Why the cruiser, sir? That's all I can tell about it now. He's firing at us. Hey, what's he lobbing space torpedoes at us for? Doesn't he know this is a space patrol ship? I think he does, Happy. I'm the one he wants to get. You? But who would want to... Oh, Brokaw. Yes. Commander, do you mind if I try to contact him? Go ahead, Gelwin. Brokaw, this is Gelwin of the Galactic Peace Commission, Loma Division. Brokaw, do you hear me? Yes, Gelwin. I've been waiting for you. How did you know I was aboard the commander's ship? I intercepted Corey's conversation with the prospect. I have been watching Titan since your own ship landed there. I have also overheard your hyperspace message. Corey knows that you're responsible for what's happening to the people in Saturn City. When you show up with the remedy, you'll be captured. That's right, Brokaw. You won't be able to profit by your extortion plot. I disagree, Commander. You have not seen an entire city in the grip of an epidemic of despair. When the sickness really takes hold, your United Planet government will do anything to obtain the remedy, at any cost. If that's the case, what will you gain by destroying us? Carolyn knows too much about me. You two working together could cause me some annoyance. Now, Commander, for the conversation you If you'll excuse me, I will resume the pleasant task of exterminating you. Well, there's no use of getting to his final sensibility in that track, Commander. Oh, well, that was close, Commander. The thing is lame with this torpedo. Why don't we give him some of his own medicine? If we give him a few glasses for that space, well, we can't. can't. Now, to think about those people in Saturn City. If we destroy Drokov, we destroy the only person who can cure that epidemic. He's gaining on us, sir. Smoking rockets we can't fight back, so all Drokov has to do is keep firing until he hits us. I'm taking back to half. We're heading for Saturn's ring. But sir, Drokov can still follow us. He won't follow us where we're going. 
Taking the ship right into the ring. What? Why don't jump the rock and turn the ship into a sieve? We'll go in on a tangent. The choice between getting hit with a thousand fragments or one torpedo. Commander, you aren't really going to go into that ring. Yes. And to nudge our way in gently. We we'll match our velocity to the particles in the outer rim. We'll be riding along with them, sort of rolling with a pen. It might work, Commander. That's the only repeller ray, about one pen power. Yes, sir. We're going to grab a ride on Saturn's merry-go-round. When those particles seem to be standing still, we'll pull into the stream. We're almost at match velocity now, Commander. The repeller ray ought to keep off any particles that come too close. Rokoff's still firing at us. Uh-oh. He's changed sectors. Good. That means he won't try to follow us into the ring. Well, those particles are all around us now, sir. They look like they're going to be fixed outside our viewport. A swarm of bees. And if we don't disturb those bees, we won't get stung. Now the trick is to work our way deeper into the ring. Can you do it, sir? If we increase our velocity gradually, as we move toward the inner part of the ring, it ought to work. Then you can spiral your way in here through the ring. No. I will stay in long enough to convince Brokoff that we're finished and come out through the top. I bet he's already sure that we're still holding. Gellin, you better cut in the hyperspace receiver. If Brokoff keeps in close touch with his Confederates back in Kelowna, he may learn something about it. Nothing on the receiver so far. I'll try another frequency. All right, Kevin. I think we can work our way out of the ring now. I've got something. There's some code. I can't make it out. Is it people on it? I don't know. Yes, I'm certain of it. Gelwood is dead. Do not have to worry about his meddling anymore. Okay. I'm not only rid of Gelwood, the commander of the United Planet Space Patrol as well. The fools dived into a ring of fragments that whirl around the planet Saturn. They must have been ground to pieces. Good work, Commander, just like you said. I've got more good news, Ormark. The situation in Saturn City is desperate. Half the population has become so depressed by the effects of the weed spores that they aren't working. Communication, transportation, power, they're all disrupted. The accident rate is way up. I'll wait a few days for real panic to set in. Then I'll appear with my magic remedy. I'll ask a million credits first. And if the officials quibble or delay, my price will go up. I've got quantities of the remedies stashed all over the solar system. There's a supply on Saturn moon number nine, in the lunar-type spaceship, all earmarked for Saturn City. The remedy will stay there until they meet my price. I'll keep you informed, Ormark. Don't go about. The lunar-type ship in the 19. You can under- if you only knew what part of the moon. 19 is seven. Small, only 200 miles in the it shouldn't take us long to find the ship unless it's hidden. We'll spiral out of this rock swarm and head for the ninth moon. A few moments later, the Terra 5 emerges from the outer rim of the whirling rings of Saturn like a silver spark from a spinning grindstone. Buzz sets the vector for Saturn's ninth moon. Then comes the long, patient search at the surface of the tiny Saturn. Like six times around, Commander. It'll take about 12 more to cover the surface completely. Every inch of that moon surface looks just like a net. Commander, look. The right edge of the view stick. Better rock? Yeah, it's too smooth for a rock. Increase the sensitivity height. Yes, sir. I think it's good rest. Do not tight ship. Into your space, it's going to land. Buzz sets the Terra 5 down on the surface of the moon. Then, in spacesuits and with ray guns ready, they advanced toward the small ship. There possibly isn't anyone aboard, but we can't afford to take chances. We may have trouble getting into the ship, Commander. No call probably locked the hatch. I thought of that. The Thomas Court will do the trick. Now you two wait here. I'll put the ladder first. Get there. Locked, all right. A couple of blasts of the port will take care of that. All right, come aboard. Get there. We'll try the story from the bottom first. Now, it won't take long to search this ship. Start to that captain. Well, there's some small containers here, but I can't read the label. My native language, Norma. They're mostly ordinary chemicals. Yeah. Remedies will weed and despair. Hey, wonderful! I'm going to get a small bottle. 
there are thousands of people in the entire city, which will be enough. Fortunately, the remedy to be the root of millions of times is still be a thing. So how can we get it to the people? That's a good question. The nature of the victims themselves is working against them. The victims have any initiative or any desire to get well. They won't cooperate because they can't. They wouldn't show up for treatment. And we'd have to find people that aren't sick and train them to administer the treatment. That's no problem. Merely drinking water with a diluted solution in it will affect the cure. Yeah, but remember that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Only in this case, uh, we can't even lead the people to water, though. There's another way. Gelman, what if this concentrate were added to the city of water supply? Would it be strong enough to work? I think so. In fact, I'm sure of it. Just that small bottle for thousands of people? Yes, sir. What we have here will take care of a city up to half a million of population. Then we're safe. Be sure that we can reach every man, woman, and child in the city. And have provided they aren't too bored with life uh, to get up and get a drink of water, no worry. The advantage is a second, no matter how little the victims are. One desire remains. One drive that will stir them to have to Sir, no safe. All right, then. We'll blast off and get this remedy to Saturn City. Then we'll go after the drunk A preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure in just a moment. Boys and girls, there's a wonderful way for you to get the things you want. Say you want a new bike or camera or whatever it is. Well, the way to get it is the United States Savings Bond. Now, here's the plan. You put your dimes and quarters, a part of your money, into your school savings plan. Might want to save cash or fill up a savings stamp album, which holds $18.75 worth of stamps. That's enough to buy a $25 savings bond. Just get started on a thrift habit, and first thing you know, you can buy the things you need with your own money. You will have the fun of watching your dimes and quarters grow into dollars. Dollars all your own. Again, the important thing is to be sure you take advantage of your school savings plan each week. You'll find it's lots of fun and smart, too. Now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have become infected with a dangerous, weakening sickness and are frantically searching a laboratory on Venus, hoping to find the one medicine that will cure them. We don't get some of that solution soon. We'll be of no use to ourselves or anything. No use to right now. I'm just going on my own momentum. Okay. Look at that. Top shelves. The bottom. Oh, yeah. Look at that. That's your window. I'll be careful. Let's not go. It's probably all the reason the whole place. If we can only get it to the ship, I'll get it to the ship. Oh, it's broke up. He's got a blast gun. Oh, Be with us next week for the thrilling Space Patrol story, The Fugitive from Kalorma. Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Cameron as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robinson, executive producer Helen Moser. Other players were Ken Mayer, Bela Kovac, and Norman Jolly. Dick Wesson speaking. Don't forget to tune in next Saturday at the same time for exciting adventure on Space Patrol! <laughs> this program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the armed forces radio service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. <laughs>